welcome to our class on scientific socialism. Now, this is one class in a series of courses that we're going to be holding every Thursday at 7 p.m. right here at the driving school. Um, they will be taught by Caleb Maupin. Caleb is a widely, a widely acclaimed speaker, writer, journalist, and political Not activist. Not all of them. Other people. <laughs> Other people will be given. Next week it will be my friend Wendell. That's true. Um, yeah. This particular one will be given by Caleb. Um, some of the classes will be taught by other members of our group. Um, but as, as the cl classes grow and develop, we're going to cover a wide range of topics. Um, Caleb himself has traveled extensively to the Middle East and Latin America. Um, and he was involved with the Occupy Wall Street movement from its very early planning stages. Um, and has been involved in many other struggles for social justice in the United States. Uh, he's an outspoken advocate of international friendship and cooperation, as well as 21st century socialism. He's spoken in the past specifically about socialism with American characteristics. Today's class, which is about the topic of scientific socialism, will be divided into four parts. Each part will be followed by a Q&A after each section. So without further ado, I introduce Caleb Melvin. So if you want to understand the world around you, you need to understand this phrase. A does not equal A. A does not equal A. Now what does that mean? It means that there is no possible way that this first A could be the same as the second A. There's no possible way. No matter how much and how similar this A is, to the second A, there's going to be some kind of difference. Because nothing in the universe is the same as anything else. The world is constantly in a state of change. Nothing in the universe is the same. All that exists in the universe is matter, but that matter is constantly in motion. It's constantly in a state of flux. Heraclitus was a famous philosopher of ancient Greece. He said, you never step into the same river twice, right? The world is constantly in a state of change, constantly in motion. And since our inception as a species, human beings have been constantly struggling to make sense and survive and grow and change within this world that is constantly in motion. And I would say that we've done a pretty good job, right? We've taken dirt and rocks and we've turned it into iPhones and space travel and huge skyscraper buildings. We've engaged in expanding our life expectancy by decades. If you look at how long human beings live compared to how long they lived thousands of years ago, it's a pretty massive difference. We've multiplied our population exponentially. No other species has accomplished anything near what human beings have accomplished. And you cannot simply dismiss human beings as simply another animal. Frederick Engels, who was a close collaborator of Karl Marx, he differentiated human beings from other species this way. He said, all the planned action of animals has never succeeded in impressing the stamp of their will upon the earth. That was left for man. In short, the animal merely uses its environment and brings about changes in it simply by its presence. But man makes his changes by making it serve his ends, he masters it. And this is the essential distinction between man and other animals. And once again, it is labor that brings about this distinction. That's Frederick Engels. And it's the roots of our intelligence and creativity. This is what gives us the ability to force the environment to serve us and to do what other species cannot do. And for the majority of human history, we were hunter-gatherers. But unlike sheep, that go around eating whatever grass is in front of them. We became expert hunter-gatherers. Um, and our ability to be hunter-gatherers greatly, uh, greatly expanded. We became uh, able to detect patterns and figure out patterns in vegetation growth. And we became, became expert hunters. We even developed spears and rocks, early technology, in which to slay animals and become expert hunters. And it's we were so good at hunting and gathering, we were so good at it, that there was a scarcity, right? There was not enough fruits and nuts for us to gather, there were not enough animals for us to kill, and so it was, it was our excellence and our ability to perfect hunting and gathering that laid the basis for the first big social revolution and the creation of agriculture, right? We started growing our own food, domesticating animals, 
Instead of wandering around, we stayed in one place. People took little pieces of land for themselves as property. Governments and states emerged in order to enforce and secure ownership of property. Human beings began owning other people. We had ancient Egypt, Mesopotamia, Greece, and Rome. And these empires and city-states emerged based on an economic system called slavery, right? where people own other people. You have private property and land. You have those who own the land. You have people owning other people. But there's a big problem with slavery. Slavery is a rather inefficient system, right? What motivation does a slave have to work? Not much, right? Uh, the, the slave owner says, you know, work or I will beat you, work or I'll deprive you of food. And on a small scale, slavery can be somewhat efficient because the slave is still a member of the household. So for the household's wealth to expand, the slave has some motivation. But when you start having huge mines and huge plantations, slavery becomes extremely inefficient, right? Um, if you think about it, right, so if you have hundreds of slaves, right, so you have, you have uh, hundreds of slaves, it's impossible for a slave master to be on top of every slave to make them keep working. So pretty soon you're going to have to have a slave whose job it is to tell the other slaves to keep working. And he's going to be Mr. Popular and just loved by everybody, you know, because that's his job. And so pretty soon you're going to have to have a slave whose job it is to tell the slaves who tell the other slaves what to do. And you can see how the bigger slavery gets, the bigger the slave plantations become, the bigger the, the, the mines become that are extracting minerals and, and creating the basis of metals. You can see how inefficient slavery becomes. And the slave societies were eventually defeated by feudalism. And feudalism is a different system in slavery. And feudalism is much more efficient. Why? In feudalism, instead of having you know, simply slaves who work because they're owned by somebody else, in feudalism, every peasant or serf has their little tract of land. And they have to pay their, land, their rent or their, their surplus or, or their, their, you know, what they owe to the landowner. They have to pay to the landowner, but whatever's left over, they get to keep for themselves. So it's much more efficient, right? They want to produce as much as they can, so that what's left over for themselves, they, they get to keep. And it was after the fall of Rome that we saw the rise of feudalism in Europe. And the feudal system existed for quite a long time, and it was backed up by the Roman Catholic Church. Right? You had you know, your feudal landowner, your noble, and they owned a tract of, of land. There were a group of people who worked it. They paid their tributes, and then the nobles were kept in line by a king. And the king derived his power from the Roman Catholic Church, and that was the feudal system. But it had problems. The feudal system had some big problems, because every so often there would be a famine or a food shortage. And all of a sudden, these peasants might refuse to pay what they owed to their landowner and rise up and revolt. The other thing was that the population started to expand. And as the population started to expand, uh, the feudal system wasn't producing enough food for that population. So you had things like the Crusades. Are folks familiar with the Crusades? Where the Pope calls for all these Christians in Europe to go and invade Jerusalem, to retake Jerusalem. He has a whole story about the, the Holy Grail, and, and it's this big noble mission. And thousands and thousands of Christians are being mobilized to go to the Muslim world, to Jerusalem, to reseize it, to retake the Holy Grail, this great mission to reseize Jerusalem. Thousands of people die, multiple crusades. Um, and you'll notice, though, that during the crusades, they created an order called the Knights Templar. And it was like a section of, it was, they were monks, they, they couldn't get married, but they, but they were warrior monks, right? They had the red cross on their chest. So they were going to Jerusalem and, and fighting. But while they were going there, they were getting some of the knowledge from the Muslim world. At that time, the Muslim world was having the, the Muslim awakening or the Muslim, Muslim enlightenment, uh, the Islamic enlightenment, they call it. And at that point, they were making all kinds of breakthroughs in science and astronomy, and so, as the Knights Templar came back from their crusades, they were bringing with them some of that science and some of that knowledge. And that's why the Pope eventually burned the Knights Templar at the stake, because they were passing on some of that scientific knowledge that was a threat to the feudal order in Europe. You can also talk about Marco Polo. Marco Polo was going to China, and he established trade routes, and the Silk Road eventually grew, where people were importing products. You had the rise of a new class. In feudalism, everyone's either a landowner or a noble, or they're a peasant, but you had the merchants that emerged that were bringing in products from around the world, and they were neither peasants nor nobles. They were a new class that was being established. 
You also had the printing press, right? The printing press was first developed on the Korean Peninsula. It was commonly used in China. But you had Johannes Gutenberg start using the printing press in Europe. And all of this eventually culminated in a big social explosion. There's a concept that comes from Hegel. They call quality into quantity. So this is a book. It's my book, actually, City Builders and Mandels in Our Age. But it's a book, right? If I started ripping pages out of this book, it would be a book that's missing a few pages. If I kept ripping pages out, it would be a book that's missing a few pages. Not much is really changing, except the book is missing a few pages. But if we just kept ripping pages out, eventually we'd get down to there was a single page left. And one page is not a book. So we've gone from minor quantity, you know, quality changes, whereas we're just changing the nature of the book, reducing the number of pages, to once we had a book and we don't have a book anymore, right? And that concept, that understanding that minor changes gradually add up to big dramatic changes, and that's quality into quantity. It's a key concept from Hegel. Marx used it as well. And the explosion that happened in Europe in the 1700s, where we saw the overthrow of feudalism, was one of the greatest explosions in global history. We saw the feudal commons being broken up. We saw that mercantile class that was neither a peasant nor a landowner seizing power. And it was a dramatic social explosion. And it launched the beginning of a period that you can call primitive accumulation. And the period of primitive accumulation was when the feudal system was being ripped apart and the mercantile class was taking power. And it was a quite violent period. We know about the French Revolution, right? Liberty, egality, fraternity, the reign of terror, mass executions. Uh, but in Europe, uh, in, in Britain, for example, uh, King Henry VIII uh, very famously started executing homeless people, vagrants, vagabonds. They were being executed. And they made it a crime to be homeless. All these people who were peasants who had a place on the land, all of a sudden were being kicked off the land as the land's being turned into the private property of a capitalist or an owner. So thousands of people suddenly had no place in society. So they started killing them in mass. Uh, there was an uprising in Scotland, the Jacobite uprising. And in the aftermath of that uprising, there was genocide committed against the Scottish Highlanders. And in big numbers, they started slaughtering and exterminating the Scottish Highlanders. And capitalism was created in a very violent way, right? We know that eventually, right, we got the transnational slave trade, right, where people were being taken from Africa to the United States and to the Caribbean, millions dying in the process, horrendous, right? We know about the killing of the Native Americans in South, Central, and North America. It was a horrendous process. The establishment of capitalism, primitive accumulation, laying the basis of the capitalist system, turning the feudal commons and estates into private property was very violent. It was mass theft. You know, you get this, that the defenders of capitalism will say, well, well, socialism is theft, right? Well, the capitalists all just work hard, right, to, to create what they have, and, and these socialists just want to take it away. Well, capitalism began with primitive accumulation, mass theft and killing on a massive scale. And that was the first period of capitalism you can call primitive accumulation. But eventually, we know that these merchants, with their trade routes, laid the basis for factory owners and industry. And we started to see the beginning of the second period of capitalism, the period of industrialization. Right? We saw the factory system coming into being. And that was the first or the second period of capitalism we, we saw the beginning of industrialization. So we have a factory owner. Maybe it's a loom, maybe it's a textile mill, maybe it's a steel mill. And these workers are working to produce products. And we have the factory owner, the capitalist, who hires the workers to work in his factory, pays them a wage, takes the product that's produced, and sells it to make a profit. And his income comes through owning, whereas the factory worker sells their labor, and their income comes through working and renting themselves out to a boss. Right? This is the two classes, the bourgeoisie and the proletariat, coming into existence. And the factory owner has a contrary interest with the factory worker. Right? The factory owner wants to pay the worker as little as possible. The worker wants to get paid as much as possible. They have a contradiction of interests. And then that leads to a problem 
a problem in the way factory production is carried out. So let's say that you're producing a product, right? Let's say that the product you're making is this pen, right? So in order to have this pen, first you have to hire workers to assemble it. So that's your labor costs, A. And then you're going to need the materials to make the pen, B, right? And then on top of that, you're going to need to, to ship the pens to where they're being sold. So that's C, right? And the total cost of the pen is D. But here's the problem, right? The labor costs can never be equal to the total cost of the pen, right? Or else there would, you wouldn't be able to pay for everything else, or else the capitalists wouldn't be able to make any profits. So A cannot equal D. And the problem is those labor costs, those workers are also consumers. And the worker can never buy back the product he produces. And this is the basis of the boom bust cycle, where you have pretty soon the market being glutted with products that can't be sold. And this is what makes capitalism a naturally unstable system, is that the worker can never buy back the product he produces. And on top of that, the capitalist is constantly trying to advance technology to make production as efficient as possible. But at the same time, the worker uh, can't buy back the product. So the capitalist is driving to fill the market with as many products as possible, but pay the worker as little as possible in order to buy the products, and it leads to that boom-bust cycle. And we talk about the Federal Reserve System. We talk about all kinds of mechanisms that have been invented by governments. You know, the invention of the corporation and stock ownership. All kinds of things have been done to try and resolve this basic contradiction. But as long as you have capitalist production, you're still going to have this problem, right? And during the period of industrialization, we saw huge achievements taking place, right? We saw, you know, all kinds of inventions invented for the purpose of making production more efficient. Electric lights, radios, all kinds of inventions and achievements taking place, but we saw frequent panics and collapses and, and it, was, it was very, very unstable, right? They talk about the, the sweatshops that existed. They talk about, you know, the textile mills and people suffering. This was all happening in Europe. But eventually, this gave way to the next stage of capitalist development. Which is imperialism. So, imperialism began with the factory owners and the captains of industry being replaced by bankers and finance capitalists and lenders. And there's a fundamental difference between a banker and a factory owner. Because a banker makes money through lending money. A factory owner makes money through selling products. So a factory owner, he wants to pay his workers as little as possible, right? He, uh, at the same time, he wants to sell as many products as possible. But a factory owner generally wants society to become wealthier because the more prosperous people are, the more products he can sell. But a banker is very different. A banker simply wants to continue making money through lending money. And with imperialism and the rise of finance capital, we saw a, a, a dominance and the emergence of international cartels, huge multinational corporations going across the world and essentially carving out spheres of influence. Right? Uh, you talk about the opium wars in China, where they forced China to accept the importation of narcotics, forced them to accept products from Britain, uh, not allow any tariffs, beat down the economy. Um, the USA seized the Philippines. Right? We know about the Spanish-American War, but not much is written about the Philippine-American War, which was hundreds of thousands of people killed in the Philippines, forcing the Philippines to be a captive market. And what's different between imperialism and industrialization is that during industrialization, that was the capitalists trying to raise the living standards in their home country, trying to expand the apparatus of production. But imperialism was the emergence of huge multinational cartels that were actively trying to stop development in the third world, in Asia and Africa and Latin America. They're going there and they're trying to hold back economic development, keep these countries poor, captive markets, make them dependent on international corporations. Uh, for example, when the British went to India, they very famously burned down all the textile mills. India had a huge textile loom apparatus. They burned it all down and forced them to import their cloth from Britain. Right? That's imperialism. And in the time of imperialism, we saw the standard of living in the first world increasing at the expense of beating down any industrialization in the third world. And in the first world, you had the emergence of what you could call the labor aristocracy. And these were workers that were working class people, worked in a factory, worked in manufacturing, but they were well paid enough 
that they identified with the bosses and aligned with the, their own big corporations against the people in the developing world. And while you know, the USA was bombing Korea and bombing Vietnam and destroying countries in, in mass, you had you know, very prosperous manufacturing jobs in the home country, right? You had this aristocracy of labor that was necessary in order to have the unity in the first world in order to continue underdeveloping and beating down and halting development in the third world. And that was imperialism. In Lenin's book, Imperialism, the Highest Stage of Capitalism, describes this period in which banks dominate over corporations, in which they're carving out spheres of influence in the developing world, in which you have an aristocracy of labor that develops in the home country. He describes it very accurately. But then, imperialism gives way to the stage that we're in now, which is called accumulation through destruction. A friend of mine actually coined the phrase accumulation through destruction. What we're seeing now is during the period, uh, during, during the period of imperialism, at that point, you had an effort to beat down development in the developing world but to develop and raise living standards in the first world. You had this labor aristocracy of good paying industrial jobs that laid the basis for a prosperous economy in the first world at the expense of the third world. But what's happening now is essentially we're seeing the elimination of the labor aristocracy and this method through which capitalists are starting to make money off of society further impoverishing, right? I mean, for example, um, in a socialist society, self-driving cars would be a good thing. It would mean less work, and those who make, make their living driving cars could do something more, more rewarding. They could, you know, it would be great, it would be great, that would be less work for everybody, because the cars can drive themselves. But under capitalism, it means mass unemployment, it means the elimination of millions of jobs. Um, we know about the military industrial complex, which is a big aspect of the period of imperialism, but now we have a prison industrial complex. Fine, people are more unemployed, people don't have jobs, well, we can make money by locking them in jail. You know, capitalists are enriching themselves. You know about the opioid epidemic. Millions of Americans are getting addicted to opioids. And so now, you know, it, it's a way to make money. You talk about, you know, the oil prices shooting up very dramatically during the Bush years because Iraq, an oil producing country, was blown to bits, blown off the market. A country is destroyed. And then that makes the, the oil in the hands of American corporations tied in with Saudi Arabia far more valuable. You see Libya, an oil producing country, blown to bits and destroyed, and that makes the oil in the Western countries more and more valuable. Um, this is essentially the period we're in where instead of trying to hold back development in the third world and trying to develop the first world, the capitalists have gotten to the point that they are now underdeveloping the first world in a global race to the bottom, right? And we see an unfolding low-wage police state in the United States with civil liberties being stripped away. We see roads that are not being properly paved. Uh, we see bridges that are not secure. We see drinking water that is not being purified. The, the West is essentially, you know, basically what the imperialists were doing to the developing world, they're now doing to the first world as a process of capitalism's development from imperialism, its third stage, up into its fourth stage of accumulation through destruction. And that's capitalism. This is a continuation of capitalism. Capitalism is a system where the means of production only function as preliminary transformation into capital. Mao Zedong said capitalism is a system where profits are in command. And that is the natural, this is the natural conclusion of it. We've got huge multinational corporations getting wealthier, while the entire world is getting poorer and poorer. We have technology eliminating labor, and millions of people no longer having a place at the assembly line. Well, huge multinational corporations and banks based in Western countries become wealthier and wealthier. This is the reality of capitalism, and that is my first section, which I called, What is Capitalism? And that's my explanation of what capitalism is, and I think we'll break, we'll have our first break and discussion now of that period. Sound good? Mm -hmm. um, so we can begin the question and answer section based on what you've just heard on what is capitalism. Any thoughts, comments? Yeah, we'll just go around and say what they really want. Do you say that the um, stage of accumulation through destruction would be like synonymous with maybe like Kautsky's ultra imperialism? Okay, I'll address that. Uh, keep, let's keep going around. Um, that, that's pretty much it. No, no I mean, but, but, uh, I don't know. Um, just to explain again what, in simplified terms, what exactly is uh, accumulation through destruction again? Okay. 
I had a question, but I'm not sure if um, it'll make sense because um, has anyone here seen um, Endgame or Infinity War, the Avengers <laughs> movies? Yes. yes. With um, Thanos. I was thinking when he was describing it, I couldn't help but thinking that accumulation through destruction sounded kind of like what Thanos was trying to do. So I was wondering like, if there's differences in between that. I mean, we kind of on that theme, you know, of culture, like, so in Marxist theory, you know, there's a base and a superstructure, right? So you see, now you see a transformation of the base into this accumulation of destruction. How is it going to change the superstructure? How will it change people's ideology? How will it change the culture? Okay. Anything else? So what precipitated the transition from imperialism to accumulation of destruction? Okay. Anything else? Okay. So Kautsky's theory of ultra-imperialism. That was in the lead up to World War One. Karl Kautsky argued that inter-imperialist rivalries did no longer existed and that all the imperialists of the West, Germany, Britain, France, the United States were all united and that they were all kind of in agreement about colonizing the third world. They were all on the same team. Obviously that was not the case. World War One and then World War Two broke out pretty dramatically. Um, and what Kautsky was arguing uh, was, was not correct. And Lenin argued that there were inter-imperialist rivalries between the countries. And the biggest rivalry was Germany, which was a very late coming imperialist country, uh, was at odds with Britain, France, and the United States. And they were competing for colonies and that eventually broke out in World War One, in which Germany was stripped of its colonies and then Germany tried to reseize its colonies in the Second World War, and that was the Second World War, and Kautsky was clearly wrong about that, and a number of other things he was wrong about. But, um, but as far as what defines accumulation through destruction, it's the deindustrialization of the First World, I think, is, is the, definitive, the definitive aspect. Um, and what laid the basis for it? Um, it's the computer revolution more than anything. But it's also, the, I would say, the rise of socialism, which I'll get into as well. I think the emerging alternative on the global economy has also helped lay the basis for that. The fact that there's the, there's the, you know, the new Silk Road and there's an alternative, that, that people around the developing world no longer have to only buy things from the West, that there is this alternative, that has also laid the basis for some of it. Um, and there are a number of factors that play into it, but the computer revolution is probably the main thing, that's what I would say. Um, um, as far as base and superstructure, there has been a dramatic shift in the ideology of the first world since the 1960s and 70s, really since the 50s, right? Um, and that, that in a lot of ways, uh, some of the social conservatism and hangovers of feudalism that were existing in the West were almost stripped away. And you see the West kind of presenting itself almost as a champion of social liberalism, which I think is interesting. It's been a big ideological shift in the West. And I think that has laid the basis. In some ways, you can call that an ideological shift that is laying the basis for accumulation through destruction, which I think is interesting. Um, but yeah, shall we go on to section two, or is there anything further? I just wanted to, uh, like, I agree that, you know, Kowski, like, historically, ultra-imperialism wasn't the correct theory. But, like, today, um, it just seems to me that there's only one real imperialist block. Um, that's kind of how I'm using it. You know, uh, U.S. NATO has become the, you know, singular imperialist block in the world. It's hard to call, um, you know, PRC and the RF imperialist powers, in my, in my opinion. That's kind of why I'm referring to that. And it's almost like they were able to engage in this accumulation through destruction more with ease because there is or there was no real existential challenge to their system from, like, uh, 1991 to maybe, like, um, the outbreak of the Syrian Civil War. Um, so that's just kind of my uh, addendum to that. Anybody else? Um, actually, uh, to your point about um, Civil War and, and um, Infinity War and things like that, um, it's interesting, Thanos um, actually is more of an allegory for um, the, so when it comes to environmentalism, right, there's a lot of different theories. Thanos is more of an allegory of the way it's been explained for the theory of overpopulation, and that ties actually a lot into accumulation through destruction in the ways in which people are trying to um, use the problems that are created by capitalism and the way they're affecting the environment and blame them on the individual. One of these ways is overpopulation, and the doctrine of overpopulation is sort of represented by Thanos' idea, which is that there are too many people, thus we must have the population, um, in a way that's a very similar 
parallel to the ways in which corporations are sort of pushing this narrative as, as one of the um, ways in which we could improve the environment. Um, I think in later sections we'll sort of go into as well the ways in which, um, and, and in other classes as well, environmentalism and the effect that capitalism has on the environment. But I think it's more of an allegory for that than anything else. Okay. In terms of the culture, I, I, I think, to me it seems like American culture is increasingly violent, not just violent, but like celebrating violence. So in the sense that you have like you know video games which are extremely violent, you have um, you know now the most popular sport by far is, is American football, which is the most violent sport ever invented, you know, um, um, and then and then you have uh, you know on television um, it's dying out a little bit, but you know the most popular shows for a while were like these reality shows, where basically you watch people being humiliated, like that, that was really the idea, like we're gonna like. Put everybody on an island and eliminate them one by one until there's one last standing person. You know, so it's like this all, war against all, of all against all, and that's like what people are, are taught to strive to. Yeah, make sure what signs in. I think um, through culture, um, because culture is, especially in the United States, is mass produced by corporations, I think that the violence in popular culture is one of the ways in which the media and corporations have sort of primed us towards accumulation through mass destruction by glorifying it so that it's, it's easier for people to accept. Mm -hmm. I think it also allows us to um, that, apply this attitude of destruction in interpersonal interactions mm -hmm. and thus when corporations seek to destroy countries and populations and the average American people, I think it's a lot more digestible. Okay, shall we go on to our next section? All right, so the next section is called What is Socialism? And there's a lot of confusion about that. What is socialism? I learned in school when I was a kid that socialism is everyone gets paid the exact same wage no matter how hard they work. And so then everyone's lazy because that's bad, what socialism is. I've had other people, the more common definition you get now is socialism is whenever the government does anything. If the government does something, that's socialism. The USA I've heard is half socialist and half capitalist because we have social security in the post office and the US military, but we also have private companies. Um, there's, there's many different definitions of socialism. The first, uh, the first use of the word socialism was in France. It was Henry Saint Simon, and he was a French, uh, you know, religious man who was worried that after the French Revolution, all these people were unemployed and factory owners at that point were like raping women who worked in their factories and mistreating them. And, and it, was, it, was, it was a feeling there was something wrong with liberalism, which was the ideology of the French Revolution. They didn't say they believed in capitalism, they said they believed in liberalism, individual rights. And Henry St. Simon said, well, maybe in contrast to this liberalism, we need socialism. But he never really explained what it was, but he did a lot of charity work, and he opened some cooperative businesses, and that was Henry St. Simon, and he used the word socialism in French. The first person to use the word socialism in English was Robert Owen, and Robert Owen was a Welsh factory owner, and he started a, a colony called New Lanark, and it was a cooperative you know, commune that existed in Scotland for a while, and he eventually moved it to Indiana and set it up in the U.S. state of Indiana. It was called New Harmony, and it's still there. You can see it, it's a nice little, they got a museum there, and it was this cooperative that Robert Owen built. And he actually addressed a, a session of the U.S. Congress and gave a lecture on socialism. And he was the first guy to coin the term socialism. But Karl Marx distinguished scientific socialism from utopian socialism. Henry St. Simon, Robert Owen, others, they were utopian socialists. But Karl Marx described himself as a scientific socialist. And he described socialism this way. He said, we have seen above that the first step in the revolution by the working class is to raise the proletariat to the position of the ruling class and to win the battle for democracy. The proletariat will use its political supremacy by degree to wrest by degree all capital from the bourgeoisie, to centralize all instruments of production into the hands of the state and of the proletariat organized as the ruling class and to increase the productive forces as rapidly as possible. That's what Karl Marx laid out as his vision of socialism. Now, Frederick Engels, he described socialism. He said, the proletariat seizes the public power and by means of this transforms the socialized means of production, slipping from the hands of the bourgeoisie into public property. By this act, the proletariat frees the means of production from the character of capital they have borne thus far and gives their socialized character complete freedom to work itself out. Socialized production upon a predetermined plan becomes possible. 
The development of production makes the existence of different classes of society henceforth an anachronism. In proportion, as anarchy and social production vanishes, the political authority of the state eventually dies out. Man, at last, is the master of his own form of social organization, and he becomes at the same time the lord over nature, his own master, free. To accomplish this act of universal emancipation is the historical mission of the proletariat, to thoroughly comprehend the historical conditions and this very nature of this act, to impart to the now oppressed proletarian class a full knowledge of the conditions and of the meaning of this momentous act is called upon to accomplish. This is the task or the theoretical expression of the proletarian movement of scientific socialism. So what is the idea? Well, the idea is in capitalism, you have these means of production that are privately owned. And under capitalism, profit is the basis of the economy. Houses and buildings like this don't get built because people need a nice place to have classes. They're built so that landlords and bankers can make profit. Food isn't produced so that people can eat it. Food is produced so that agribusiness and big box stores can make money by selling it. Profit is the basis of the economy. And socialism is when the proletariat, the working class, the majority of society, takes control of the government, and then through the government, seizes control of the means of production. The economy is then forced to work in the interests of society overall. You have production upon a predetermined plan rather than production for profit. And that's the difference between capitalism and socialism. And it's pretty vague. Um, I recently debated a, a, a cap uh, an advocate of more liberal social democratic capitalism. And he kept insisting that in my defense of socialism that I lay out and, and, and explain exactly what things would be nationalized and what things would not be nationalized. Well, that's, that's Robert Owen. Robert Owen would do that, right? Um, Henry St. Simon might do that. But that's utopianism. Socialism comes about due to this contradiction between the worker and the capitalist and eventually driving the workers to rise up and seize control of the means of production. And socialism looks very, very different. And Marx predicted that socialism would happen first in the first world. He was existing in the period of industrial capitalism. He assumed eventually the workers would just rise up and seize control of their factories. That's not what happened, because capitalism moved on to its period of imperialism, where you had the labor aristocracy and the rising standard of living in the first world. And it was countries in the developing world breaking out of the control of Western bankers that basically became what socialism became in the 20th century. That was what socialism was. It was countries around the world that had been kept in feudal or semi-feudal conditions and been unable to develop because of imperialism. And it was them rising up, seizing control of their economies, and building socialism. And really, after the Russian Revolution, you had you, you had, you know, the Russian Revolution, the Bolsheviks take power, and at that point you had 15 different countries invade Russia, what became the Soviet Union, and you had a country that was blockaded, you had a country that was in very feudal, it was mainly a feudal country. There was industry, industry in the cities, but it was mainly a feudal, impoverished country. And out of the Russian Revolution and the Bolsheviks' struggle to hold on to power, you had a political model that kind of defined socialism in the 20th century. And it's generally referred to in academia as real socialism or really existing socialism. People who don't like it will call it Stalinism. But that political model developed. And that was the socialism of the Cold War, right? So you have, you have the state controlling the major industries. Um, you have five-year economic plans in which the population is mobilized to build. People who work in factories and work extra hard, they get a reward. And so you know, they call it staccanovism. Um, and, uh, you have a one party, the Communist Party, tends to be the ruling party. Um, and you have almost a political structure that in a way almost kind of mimics feudalism. You have the leader and his face is everywhere. Uh, you have the state almost kind of taking on the role of the church and, and putting out ideology with a single party. And the economy is planned. And, and this, this model of really existing socialism was very successful in raising countries out of poverty. And you wouldn't know that if you watch American media or you attend American universities. But real huge economic achievements were carried out due to really existing socialism, right? There's a good book called uh, The Soviet Economy Since 1917 by Maurice Dobb. And he describes how they launched their five-year plans in 1928. And by 1938, they had multiplied the rate of electricity 10 times. The coal production had increased three and a half times. There were 20 new tramway systems. There were 80 new bus systems. The number of hospital beds in rural areas doubled. And by 1938, the Soviet Union actually had a larger tractor production apparatus than any other country in the entire world. They also led the world in locomotive and train manufacturing. And uh, 
you have to remember, at that time, the rest of the world was having the Great Depression. And Louis Fisher, who was writing for The Nation, he said, the Soviet frontier is like a charmed circle in which the world economic crisis cannot cross. While banks crash, while production falls, and trade languishes abroad, the Soviet Union continues in an orgy of construction and national development. The scale and speed of its progress is unprecedented. The Soviet Union, the first, uh, the first mobile phone was patented in 1957. They actually, by 1985, they had developed their own home computer system, the VK0010. Uh, and all these economic achievements happened, and the whole world was kind of in awe of what the Soviet Union was doing. There was a NATO treaty that made it illegal to share any technology with them. But despite that, they had amazing breakthroughs. Um, the Encyclopedia Britannica, when they wrote the entry for Joseph Stalin in 1956, this is a sentence from their entry. It says, he found Russia working with wooden plows and left it equipped with atomic piles. Right? Now, W.E.B. Du Bois, the beloved African-American intellectual, he says, quote, what I saw in the Soviet Union was more than the triumph of physics. It was the growth of a nation's soul, the confidence of a great people, and its plan and the future. We begun to recognize the Soviet Republic as giving its people the best education of any in the world, excelling in sciences, and organizing industry at the highest levels. Uh, the New York Times in 1931 marveled at the Soviet Union's educational achievements. They, this is from the New York Times, 1931, December 1st. There seems to be no parallel in history to the drive for learning in all branches of knowledge, from reading and writing to the abstruses of science, as is now in progress in the Soviet Union. Before the revolution, only 7 million children attended school. Now there are 23 million. Um, I mean, that, that was the New York Times. Uh, Fraser Hunt, who was an American, uh, American uh, journalist, he was writing for the New York American, he said, quote, Japan, westernizing and industrializing itself 50 years ago, was doing child's play compared to what the Soviet Union is doing today. Already, almost overnight, the USSR has become an industrial country. Um, and the Soviet Union also had a huge impact on global culture. For example, the, the fact that nowadays racism is considered to be a bad thing, that has a lot to do with the Soviet Union. It was the Soviet Union, from its inception, believed the notion that one race is superior to another was false and fought against it and inserted that into public consciousness. That was something people believed all over the world. W.B. Du Bois, an African-American man who studied in the Soviet Union, said, the Soviet Union seems to be the only European country where people are not more or less taught to look down on some class, group, or race. I know countries where race and color prejudice show only slight manifestations, but no white country where race and color prejudice seem so absolutely absent. That was W.E.B. Du Bois. And it's largely understood that the birth of the modern civil rights movement of the United States, where Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, became a household name, was after the lynching of Emmett Till. Right? He was an African-American man who was accused of whistling at a white woman. Uh, the owners of the store came and killed him and were acquitted in court. Well, the reason that that case created such a huge splash was because the Soviet Union took the image of Emmett Till's mutilated body and sent it all over the world and humiliated the United States. The Cold War was going on, and, and the, United, uh, the United States was saying that we're a land of freedom and these are communist dictators. And then the Soviet Union just held up that picture and said, oh, really? That's, that's your idea of freedom? And it was in that context that the northern wing of the Democratic Party and the Kennedy administration started to move against the rival wing of the Democratic Party, the Dixiecrats of the U.S. South. The Soviet Union had a lot to do with writing the U.N. Charter in the aftermath of the Second World War and condemning racism and bigotry. The Soviet Union also gave huge amounts of support to people in Africa that were fighting against colonialism and imperialism. And that also forced the United States to address the issue of racism. And, and the Soviet Union and the international efforts they did had a lot to do with the struggle against racism in the United States. Um, you know, and, and everywhere that really existing socialism came into being, it had huge economic breakthroughs. I mean, and, and you don't have to listen to them. You don't have to take their word for it. I mean, a great resource is the U.S. Library of Congress. Uh, they, the Federal Research Division of the Library of Congress published, has published a study of every country in the world. And this is their study of Romania, a very poor country in Eastern Europe. This is what it says. It says, between 1950 and 1971, the number of hospital beds per 1,000 people more than doubled in Romania. The number of doctors per 1,000 people increased by 25%. The infant mortality re rate was reduced by 75% from 1950 to 1984. 
In 1945, only 27% of the people were able to read and write. However, by 1966, illiteracy was eradicated. By 1970, the number of teachers had tripled, and the number of university professors in Romania had gone from only 2,000 before the Second World War to 13,000. Right? For a very small, impoverished country, these are big, dramatic changes. Right? If you take a country and you, you expand access to health care, you wipe out illiteracy, you expand universities, you, I mean, this is huge. This is very, very big. People who say socialism has failed everywhere it's ever been tried, it's never accomplished anything, just doesn't match the facts. Cuba is very famous for its accomplishments, especially in the field of health care. I'm reading from The Guardian. Cuba's literacy rate is at 100%. And its life expectancy parallels first world nations, despite limited funding and supplies. The country's high ratio of doctors to patients and its proactive community centered approach to health care has long been the envy of many first world countries, not the least the United Kingdom. Um, you know, Cuba, uh, UN General Secretary Ban Ki moon said that their medical school is the most advanced medical school in the world. Um, so that's their achievements. And, I mean, even after the fall of the Soviet Union and the economic hardships, you know, you can look at the CIA World Factbook and compare the life expectancies between Cuba and the surrounding countries. Cuba's life expectancy is 78.9 years, about the same as the United States. Dominican Republic, 71 years. Jamaica, 74 years. Honduras, 71 years. Guyana, 68 years. Mexico, 76 years. Guatemala, 71 years. Haiti, 64 years. Right? I mean, it's pretty dramatic that the socialist system has done a lot to improve people's lives in Cuba. Of course, we're not going to hear about that in the United States. It's also funny that, you know, we'll often hear about North Korea and the economic hardships that North Korea has had since the 1990s, the fall of the Soviet Union, the food shortages. But this is actually from an article from the BBC published in 2008. This is what they said about North Korea's economic development. At one time, North Korea's centrally planned economy seemed to work well, indeed. In the initial years after the creation of North Korea following World War II, with spectacular results, the mass mobilization of the population, along with Soviet and Chinese technical assistance and financial aid, resulted in annual growth rates estimated to have reached 20 and 30 percent in the years following the devastating Korean War. As late as the 1970s, South Korea languished in the shadow of the, quote, economic miracle north of the border. Now, obviously, they've had problems during the 1990s and the fall of the Soviet Union. But the fact that there were huge achievements in industrialization, that, that you know, they built hospitals all over the country, they wiped out illiteracy in the country, they, they industrialized the country, again, gets kind of glossed over. Remember, socialism just fails everywhere it's ever been tried. And that's, that was really existing socialism. And that was the model that kind of defined the Cold War. And obviously, that model had big problems in terms of human rights and the way people were treated. Um, and it had big problems in terms of, of you know, not having a market sector and, and people that were intellectuals and academics kind of being stifled and stuck. But we've had other forms of socialism that have come into existence. For example, in the Arab world, right, you had Baathist Arab socialism. And that was a political movement. Uh, Baath means rebirth in Arabic. And there was a guy named Michel Aflac, and he was a Syrian, and he was in the Communist Party. But when the Second World War broke out, the Communist Party of Syria was basically saying that the French, that, that there had to be peace with the French occupiers. And he, being a Syrian and didn't like French colonialism, broke with the Communist Party and formed his own party, the Baathist Party. And the Baathist Party eventually took power in Iraq, it eventually took power in, in Syria. Um, we've also seen other forms of Arab socialism. There was Arab socialism in Egypt with Abdel Nasser, there was Islamic socialism in Libya. Let's talk about what Baathist Arab socialism has done in Syria. And the Soviet Union provided Syria with $100 million to build the Takba Dam on the Euphrates River. It's considered to be the backbone of all economic development in Syria. Uh, for the first time in Syria's history, the country achieved full primary school enrollment for males, and 85% of females also enrolled in school. In 1981, 40, in 1981, 42% of Syria's adult population was illiterate. By 1991, according to the United Nations, they had wiped out illiteracy in the country. Um, between 1970 and 2009, the life expectancy in Syria increased by 17 years. During this time, the infant mortality rate dramatically dropped from 132 deaths per 1,000 live births to only 17. And that's according to the Evincia Journal of Medicine. And that they just kind of marveled at what the Syrian Baathist Arab Socialist government did in terms of bringing access to health care to the population. And the US Library of Congress country study describes the Baathist government of Syria saying it was known for massive expenditures for the development of irrigation, electricity, 
water, road building projects, and the expansion of health services and education to rural areas, right? The, 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 the increases in the standard of living in Syria under the Ba'athist Arab Socialist government have been dramatic. You see all these articles coming out, and they're just, they can't understand why all these people in Syria would fight against, uh, against the, the extremists and religious fanatics that want to overthrow the Syrian government. Well, maybe it has something to do with the fact that the Syrian government has so dramatically improved people's living standards. It also has a lot to do with the fact that the Syrian government protects religious minorities, like Christians, like Alawites, and others, who would be persecuted if the extremists that are trying to overthrow the Syrian government came to power. But the Western media just can't understand why Syrians would want to defend the Ba'athist Arab Socialist government. Well, they should read what the Library of Congress says. It pretty dramatically explains it. You know, in, in the 2000s, uh, we've seen the rise of Bolivarian socialism in Latin America. That's a different model. It's governments that are elected, um, and the elections are kind of referendums on Western neoliberalism. And these Bolivarian governments have come to power, and they've had dramatic achievements. In Nicaragua, uh, the construction projects uh, uh, have o overall uh, reduced poverty by roughly 30 um, percent. The GDP of Nicaragua since the Sandinistas came to power back into power in 2006, the GDP has gone up by 36 percent. Uh, the World Happiness Report, published by the United Nations, lists Nicaragua as having the greatest increase in happiness of any country in 2017. Bolivia, which nationalized its oil and natural gas production, um, it actually uh, has seen very dramatic increases in the standard of living. Uh, the rate of illiteracy in Bolivia when Morales came to power was 16%. Now, according to the United Nations, there is no illiteracy in Bolivia. And it was Cuban volunteers who came in and wiped out illiteracy. Uh, the Bolivian government under Evo Morales has built roads all over the country in places they didn't have them before. This is, this is according to Bloomberg News. By 2017, Bolivia was 42% richer than when Morales took office, 42% richer, right? Poverty has declined by 25% since he was elected. That's Bloomberg News that is admitting the dramatic economic achievements. And Venezuela, they've recently had their hardships, but you know, in 1998, before Hugo Chavez was elected, Venezuela only had 12 public universities. Now it has 32 public universities. Free healthcare is provided to all citizens in Cuba, by Cuba or in, in Venezuela by Cuban volunteers. Uh, they have free heating and cooking gas. Adult illiteracy has been wiped out. Between 1995 and 2009, poverty in Venezuela has decreased by 50%. They have interest-free loans for people to buy loans. I actually walked through a neighborhood in Caracas where every single house had been paid for by an interest-free loan provided by the Bolivarian government. Uh, they have cheap public transportation, and all of this is paid for by state-controlled oil resources. Um, so I wanted to end uh, this section about what is socialism and what is it has accomplished. I just want to go over some of the wonders of the world that have been built by socialism. Uh, the first one I want to talk about is the Aswan Dam in Egypt. Abdel Nasser, the Arab socialist leader who was elected president of Egypt, uh, he teamed up with the Soviet Union and they built the, the biggest hydroelectrical power plant in the Middle East and it electrified all of Egypt. There were whole sections of Egypt that had never had electricity and he electrified all of Egypt and it was built by Soviet technicians and Egyptians mobilized by a socialist government. The China-Pakistan Friendship Highway. It's one of the highest and longest paved roads in the world, 810 miles long, and it's very high elevated. It was built in an alliance between China and Pakistan in 1966. The Great Man-Made River of Libya. That's the world's largest irrigation system. Right? It is the largest irrigation system in the world. It was very damaged in 2011 during the Libyan war, but it's still functional. It was built by the Islamic Socialist government of Gaddafi. They built the world's largest irrigation system, enabled Libya to start growing their own food on a much bigger scale. It was very dramatic. The Soviet space program. No one ever talks about the fact the Soviet Union had the first satellite. The Soviet Union had the first person in outer space, right? Uh, during the 1930s, the Soviet Union built the Dnieper Dam, was at that point the biggest hydroelectric power plant in the world. Well, it's not the biggest hydroelectric power plant in the world anymore. Today, the biggest hydroelectric power plant in the world is actually the Three Gorges Dam in China, a government-controlled uh, hydroelectric power plant that was built by the socialist government. And the China Railway Corporation is at this point making the fastest trains in the world. And I just wanted to end this section by talking about an example that I think clearly illustrates the difference between capitalism and socialism. And that's what happened in China in July of 2015. July 8th and 9th of 2015, the Chinese stock market dropped by roughly 
1,400 companies filed for a trading halt. Imagine if that happened in the United States. 55% of the population of the United States is directly tied into the stock market. A 30% drop on the stock market. There would be riots in the streets. Food would not be delivered to stores. It would result in an utter societal collapse. And that didn't happen in China. In fact, less than 6% of the Chinese population is in any way tied into the stock market. And on July 8th and 9th, the Chinese government stepped in with what they called anti-selling measures. The Communist Party announced that anyone caught short-selling or betting that a stock would go down would be immediately arrested. They also banned uh, all, sharehold all major shareholders from selling any of their stocks for six months. The state-owned enterprises followed government direction and were carefully managed. And like two weeks later, the Chinese stock market had dramatically gone up again, right? Because the Chinese economy is not centered around the profits of the people on the stock market. It's centered around the state. The state controls the means of production. The stock market simply exists as a vehicle for bringing in foreign investment. And, and because of that, they were able to just dramatically recover from an event that would have wiped us out in the United States. Why? Because profits are not in command. You know, there are difficulties in socialist countries. There have been many bad things that have been done. But this notion that you can't have socialism and have growth. Socialism has created a huge, huge amount of economic growth in the world. It has proved that a society without profits in command can make dramatic improvements, raising people out of poverty, electrifying, uh, wiping out illiteracy. I mean, huge achievements have happened under the leadership of socialist governments. So that's how I want to end section two. And this begins our question and answer section um, based, based on this. Any comments, questions, anything to add? Yes. Yes, uh, you spoke of um, various types of socialisms around the world, uh, in practical uh, things. But then you started with scientific socialism. And I still don't understand what you mean by scientific socialism. What, what is scientific about it? OK. Any other questions or comments to be addressed? Yes. Uh, I was wondering if there's any um, connection between um, scientific literacy and um, advocate, advocacy of socialism because um, I've noticed that uh, in a lot of places where um, socialism had a big influence, though this is just something that I've noticed uh, myself that it's much more common for them to um, not discount global warming and care about its effects, whereas like places where like neoliberalism has um, a big say is like that's where you get the most like global warming deniers. Okay. Um, you spoke about the various uh, national forms of socialism and you didn't say anything about I think is equally important the emergence of things phenomenon like the brick uh, as an alternative banking system and uh, by extension, the biggest threat to the existing neoliberal establishment, imperial establishment. Uh, how do you see that progressing? Especially in the case of the efforts of the United States to, to carry out its time-trodden, artificial uh, destabilization programs of countries like Venezuela and Iran, and, and the obvious failure of that uh, that is evidenced by the, uh, the disappearance of Mr. Bolton. Uh, maybe you might want to talk a little bit about why the socialist world during this period was not able to really unite. Because you had the split between Soviet Union and China, which is huge, but also like there were others like Albania was, you know, kind of stood apart from the rest of the socialist bloc, et cetera. Okay. All right. Shall I address that? All right. So first of all, the difference between scientific socialism and utopian socialism is really the difference between materialism and idealism. Does socialism come into existence because of ideas in someone's mind, or does socialism come into existence because of material conditions in society? And the utopian socialists said, hey, we have this vision for what an ideal world should look like. Let's go put it into practice. Let's go get our little tract of land and try to build our ideal heaven on earth society. But you know, materialist and scientific socialism says that socialism emerges from the contradictions in capitalism. The contradiction between the worker and the capitalist, the contradiction between the developing world and the first world, that is what lays the basis for socialism. And that's the difference between scientific socialism and utopian or idealist socialism. That's the, the primary difference. Now, what you raised about scientific literacy, I actually wanted to read this. Um, Albert Einstein was a big supporter of socialism. 
um, you know, the most famous scientist in all of world history. This is what he wrote in an essay published in 1949 called Why Socialism. He said, I am convinced there is only one way to eliminate the grave evils, namely through the establishment of a socialist economy, accompanied by an educational system which will be oriented towards social goals. In such an economy, the means of production are planned by society itself and are utilized in a planned fashion. A planned economy, which adjusts production to the needs of the community, would distribute the work to be done among all those who are able to work and would guarantee a livelihood to every man, woman, and child. That's Albert Einstein, the, great, the most famous scientist in the world, right? So I, I, I think that's pretty cool. But as far as what you were asking about climate change, I feel like you know climate change is a reality, right? You can't deny climate change. But among today's capitalists, there are two viewpoints, right? You've got the fracking companies. You've got the small capitalists. And they're afraid that environmental regulations are going to cut into their profits. And so their attitude is, you know, climate change isn't real, it's fake, it's something they made up to ruin my profits, a communist conspiracy. That's the lower levels, right? But then you have the higher levels of American capital and the higher levels of international corporations. They say, yes, climate change is a reality. And that means all these countries that are trying to raise themselves up out of poverty, they just can't do it. Right? You know, it'll be bad for the earth, guys. You know, just to, and, and you'll see this, right? And Obama, the speech he gave in Africa, where he told people in Africa that basically they shouldn't, they should stay in poverty for the sake of the environment. You know, that seems to be their attitude. But what's coming out of China and the socialist world right now, and that'll get to what you raised, their attitude toward the problem of climate change is the opposite. They say it doesn't mean that we should end development and end historical progress. That climate change proves the necessity of advancing technology beyond fossil fuels and making new breakthroughs that have never been made before. That climate change necessitates an alternative to fossil fuels. It necessitates fusion energy. It necessitates the space program, right? That, 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 that the answer to climate change is to continue advancing faster than ever before. It's not a pessimistic view of the climate crisis. It is an optimistic view. It's an understanding that just like we, you know, humans overcame the, the Black Death that they talked about in Europe, just like humans overcame you know, the scarcity that existed at the time of hunter-gatherer civilization, that this proves that with socialism and economic planning, we must advance, and that's the difference. And that's very similar to the BRICS. There's an alternative in global trade that's emerging right now. The way neoliberalism and Western trade works is the USA goes to an impoverished country and says, okay, we'll give you a loan to develop your country, but in order to do it, you need to privatize all your state-owned industries, right? And you need to stop subsidizing domestic corporations. So we'll give you this loan, and then you have, to, you have to privatize. And pretty soon, American companies come in there, and they put all the local manufacturers out of business. And, and the country's economy is, is basically looted, and they become a captive client state in exchange for getting a development loan that helps them keep the electricity on. What China does is the opposite. It goes to developing countries. And it says, OK, you could really use a power plant here. And it builds a huge hydroelectrical power plant. I've seen some of these hydroelectrical power plants built by China and Brazil. They go to a developing country and they say, wow, if you had a, a high-speed train connecting this part of the country to this part of the country, that would improve your economy. And this is not selfless. It's not charity. It's not. This is in China's interest. Because the wealthier that country becomes, the more that China has to trade with. right? So the China makes more money, and this country makes more money, and it's win-win cooperation. It's an alternative model in global trade. Whereas what the United States does is it's, it's zero sum. It comes in there and puts these countries out of business. What I think is very interesting is that during the period of industrial capitalism, as imperialism was starting to emerge, you saw some of the, the advocates of industrial capitalism advocating a similar model, Alexander Hamilton, uh, Henry Clay, they had similar theories. They, they argued that the state should protect industrial capital, and they were arguing the United States should sponsor infrastructure projects in, in developing countries, and they had some theories that are similar to what China's putting out now, but it's not the same. But, but China's vision of global trade is countries getting wealthier together, right? Win-win cooperation. It's an alternative to the U.S. model of global trade. And you'll notice that the response of the World Bank and the IMF is almost to admit that China is right in its criticism. They're throwing up their hands and saying, you know what, we were too neoliberal during the 1990s. We were too free market. We went too far. Oops, we screwed up. That's kind of their response. They don't even try to counter the narrative. Because everyone saw what happened in Latin America during the 1990s. I went to Ecuador in the 1990s, 1999. I was 12 years old. I got off the plane. I had never seen that level of poverty. 
I mean, just crowds of starving people out in front of the airport. Desperate poverty. What had happened? Well, the USA and the IMF and the World Bank had forced Ecuador to give up its domestic currency and start using the dollar. They had privatized the land, and thousands of people from the countryside of Ecuador were being forced off their land and into the cities, and it was a dramatic, horrific thing. When I was in Venezuela, people talked to me about how during the 1990s, you know, Venezuela would need a loan from these Western banks, and so they would, to get their loan, they would say, okay, well, you need to lay off sanitation workers, right? You're spending too much money on sanitation workers. And so it would get to be that in certain parts of the, the capital city, you know, the, the, the garbage wouldn't be collected for weeks, right? The, the electricity, they would say, you have too much, you're spending too much money on your, your, electric, you know, your electrical system and your power plant. So, so it got to the point that the electrical system was just going off because the government didn't have the money. Uh, the Bolivarian movement in Venezuela traces its origins to an uprising that happened in response to a very dramatic increase in the cost of public transportation, the Caracazo. Neoliberalism was a nightmare in Latin America. It was also a nightmare in the former Soviet Union. The fall of the Soviet Union, the, the shock therapy economic uh, you know, you know, reforms that were imposed uh, by Jeffrey Sachs, by George Soros on, on you know, Eastern Europe were dramatic. I mean, you know, the rate of, of suicide went through the roof, the rate of drug addiction went through the roof. All the factories were closing their doors. The agricultural system shut down and they started having to import all their food from, from the United States and from Western Europe. You know, free market neoliberalism imposed on the world by the IMF and the World Bank was an economic disaster. They don't even try to pretend it wasn't, but it wasn't being done to raise these countries out of poverty. It wasn't like an experiment. It was being done to secure a monopoly for Western corporations. That's why it was being carried out. And it very effectively did that until in, in Russia you had the rise of Vladimir Putin, who created Gazprom and Rosneft and turned these two giant energy corporations into, into the basis of, of, of kind of a state-centered economy that could counter the West. And that was, that was a very dramatic uh, shift that happened when, when Putin got into office. But until then, I mean, you, we saw Eastern Europe being gutted, and, and, and much of Eastern Europe is still suffering under this. Uh, when George Bush invaded Iraq, he talked about the new Europe. Right? He said that France and Germany, all the countries that didn't agree with him, they were, the, they were the old Europe. They're the old Europe. There's this new Europe. There's Lithuania and Estonia and Latvia. And if you look at the new Europe countries, still, these countries have never recovered from the fall of the Soviet Union. They were gutted and economically destroyed by Western banks. And China's model of global trade is different. And, you know, people hear this and they, they I, let me repeat, I'm not saying that China is being selfless. I'm not, this isn't the Soviet Union, you know, sending, sending aid to Africa. This is, this is China working in its interest, but seeing its own economic interest in being this country raising up out of poverty. And China, what China is doing in terms of fossil fuels right now is amazing. China imports most of its oil. That's a weakness they have. That's why they're trying to control the South China Sea and make sure those oil tankers can continue to go through the South China Sea. They realize it's a weakness. So what China is doing in terms of forcing both domestic Chinese companies and international companies to, to uh, build electric cars or new energy vehicles is really dramatic. They're changing the global car market like overnight. It's really, really dramatic. So that's really important what you raised. Um, and, and what you raised about, about the divide in the socialist countries. The next section I'm going to talk about this, the international Marxist movement or socialist movement. So I'm going, to, I'm going to talk about that for sure. That's in the next section. So do we have anything else? Or do we want to go on? An addendum to that. Yeah. Uh, it is clear that the U.S. overthrew Libya because they wanted to go off the dollar exchange rate. Similar thought could be behind the overthrow of Saddam Hussein. And, uh, the same fear animates their desire to overthrow the Venezuelan uh, Republic. Uh, and of course, Evo Morales is in their, high, is in their, their sights. Uh, how can, in the, uh, I, I'd like you to speak to how the BRICS banks, uh, this new relationship between China and Russia can counteract the supremacy of the dollar, uh, which is in, is in question you know, under the discussions of global, global currency reset, how to promote that so without having the, uh, the kind of, of, of upsurge uh, of recalcitrant uh, imperialism which we seem to be seeing in the United States? Well, I, I'm not a currency expert, but I will say that I feel like, you know, Libya's efforts to introduce a new currency was not the only thing that made them a target. Um, they were also targeted for the fact that they were an oil producing country that was competing. Um, they were also targeted for the fact that they were, um, they were funding all kinds of infrastructure projects all over Africa. They were seen as an outpost of the, the BRICS and One Belt, One Road on the African continent. And prior, shortly before the overthrow of Gaddafi, he was the president of the African Union. 
and he was using his his presidency of the African Union to make really dramatic political statements about the about what Western imperialism was doing, and 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 that all led to the overthrow of Gaddafi, I think, more than anything. Um, and I, I don't think it was simply getting off the dollar. That was a factor, though, for sure. But actually, what I meant was the creation of an African Development Bank. Yeah. Right, in coordination with China, right? That would be part of the uh, the Asian Investment Infrastructure Bank, and and that would have been a dramatic reform. So, should we move on to the next section? Do we want to go on, or do we have? Because when I talk about the BRICS, yeah. I mean, honestly, where does India, where role does India play in the BRICS now? Because India seems, if anything, to be aligning the other way. Like they're totally against this the Belt and Road Initiative. Yeah, I mean, the USA seemed to be trying to be somewhat neutral between India and Pakistan until recently. And now the USA has come down strongly on India's side. And Pakistan has seen the explosion of the China-Pakistan economic corridor. So it seems like BRICS is almost on hold now that India and Modi are so in with the United States, whereas Pakistan is so solidly part of China. What started, I mentioned the China-Pakistan Friendship Highway built in 1966, in the middle of the Mao era, right? You know, they, they, that, that's how old that relationship is. But, uh, but yeah, now the explosion of the China-Pakistan economic corridor is huge, um, and there's no question about it. And the implications of the China-Pakistan economic corridor for Afghanistan are also very big, right? Because the plan that Iran, China, um, and, and China have put forward along with Pakistan is to fight terrorism and drug cartels in Afghanistan with trade and transport, right? Give Afghanistan, a landlocked country, access to the ocean through the railway. Let start having manufacturing jobs there. Give people something other than, something to do other than growing heroin and and uh, and and joining terrorist groups. Give people uh, a chance to raise their life expectancy. And and so that that also is a factor as well. And and the China Pakistan economic corridor is really really important. Um, and I think that when Trump met with Imran Khan, there was an effort to try and pull Imran Khan away from from Pakistan. And I think Imran Khan is friendly to Trump too. I think it's, you know, he's playing both sides and he's trying to work in his interest. But the USA seems to be solidly with Modi and Pakistan's relationship with China is very, very solid and based on economic ties that have really, really expanded. Does that answer your question? Uh, yeah, it's a complicated question. But yeah. You know. yeah. So. Shall we go on to the next section? All right, cool. All right, so section three, I wanted to talk about the international Marxist movement. So in 1866, Karl Marx formed the International Working Men's Association, or the first international, 1866, right? The Communist Manifesto ends with workers of the world unite. He says that the working class has no loyalty to any nation, so he's going to build an international communist organization. And he builds it, um, and Karl Marx is in London, um, and there's, uh, they estimate at least one to two million people were somehow affiliated with it. But it wasn't just followers of Karl Marx. It was basically anyone who believed in any kind of form of socialism. Um, a big section of it were anarchists, and Karl Marx spent a lot of his time at the First International fighting with anarchists. Um, and in 1872, they had the Hague Conference of the First International, in which Karl Marx and followers of Proudhon and Bakunin had their fight, and it eventually led to the split, and by 1877, there really was no First International anymore. The Marxists and the anarchists couldn't get along. Uh, the Marxists really couldn't continue having an international. The anarchists continued trying to have an international, but it didn't really work out. The primary difference uh, between them was, was the effort to seize state power or not? Karl Marx said the effort of the working class was to take control of the government. The anarchists said that taking control of government is oppressive, and that instead they should just form worker cooperatives and independent autonomous unions and things that were not coordinated because trying to seize government power was a diversion from the workers' struggle and it would lead to an oppressive state that would be just as bad. And so it was the fight, that was the demise of the first international. 1889, you have the foundation of the second international. And it's funny because there were two second internationals that were formed. Um, there was the Marxist one and the non-Marxist one. They eventually merged together. And the flagship party of the Second International was the Social Democratic Party of Germany. Um, and you know a lot of the names that you associate with Marxism in that time, in the 1890s and 1910, Karl Kautsky, Ebhardt, Edward Bernstein, were affiliated with Marxism in Germany. And German Marxism, Marxism was basically centered in Germany. The German Marxist movement was considered the center of it. And so, 1904, you have a very prominent leader of the Second International and of the German Marxist movement named Edward Bernstein. And Edward Bernstein comes along, 
and this, he's not a minor figure, Edward Bernstein, mind you. Edward, Edward Bernstein had like family connections to Karl Marx. He had translated some of the volumes of Capital and published them and edited them after Marx's death. He was a very prominent person. And he came out with his theory of revisionism, right? Because at the time, capitalism is transitioning toward imperialism, its third stage. And so because of that, um, because of that, he's saying, why are we not having revolutions? Why are, why are the working class of, of Europe not rising up? What's going on? Why is the standard of living increasing when Marx theorized that it would continue to go down? What's going on? So Edward Bernstein came out with this theory he called revisionism. He said that Karl Marx's idea that there would be a revolution and that the workers would seize control, that's wrong. He says, socialism is merely the sum of popular reforms. His slogan was, the movement is everything, the goal is nothing, right? And he basically argues that, look, he says, in Germany, we have universal male suffrage. No one was even thinking about letting women vote, but they have universal male suffrage. And there's more workers than there are capitalists. So eventually, the workers will just outvote the capitalists, we'll have socialism, you know, we have 12-hour factory days, and basically, capitalism in the Western world is just kind of naturally turning into socialism. That was Edward Bernstein's theory of revisionism. Now, the term revisionist is kind of a slur. It's like, if you don't like someone's theory, you say they're a revisionist. But Edward Bernstein said, I am a revisionist. We need to revise Marxism. And a big part of Edward Bernstein's theory of revisionism was not only this belief that capitalism in the West was just kind of naturally turning into socialism, but that imperialism and the colonization and military interventions in the developing world was good because the West is already moving towards socialism. So if they take over a country in Africa or they take over a country in Asia, well, that'll help them to get even closer to socialism as well. So the Western capitalist system is just kind of naturally turning into socialism. It's expanding all over the world. Edward Bernstein pushed these views, but the majority of the Marxist movement disagreed with it. Rosa Luxemburg very famously wrote her pamphlet, Reform or Revolution. Karl Kautsky, who was the big theoretician of German social democracy, they rejected the theory of revisionism. But that kind of thinking, revisionism, began, and that kind of laid the basis for a lot of the thinking of what you could call modern social democracy. You know, this belief that the movement is everything, the goal is nothing, that capitalism and socialism are not distinct stages, there's not an event horizon or a revolution. Socialism just kind of naturally evolves out of capitalism, and the West is bringing its more advanced system to the world. That was kind of the basis, and that's how a lot of social democrats in the world today think. Interestingly, though, Kautsky and the Second International rejected revisionism. Um, in 1912, as World War I was on the horizon, you had a gathering, the Basel Congress of the Second International, and all these parties said that they would never support an imperialist war, and they wrote a beautiful manifesto in 1912, World War I is approaching on the horizon, they write, it would be insanity for the governments not to realize that the very idea of the monstrosity of a world war would inevitably call forth the indignation and the revolt of the working class. The proletarians consider it a crime to fire at each other for the profits of the capitalists and the ambitions of dynasties with the glory of secret diplomatic treaties. To the capitalist world of exploitation and mass murder must uh, oppose in this way the proletarian world of peace, fraternity of the people. So they, they're swearing they would never support any war. All right? 1914 comes along, and all of these parties, with a few exceptions, basically supported World War I. And so, by 1916, the Second International had collapsed because they had all been at war with each other. The Germans, the German Social Democratic Party voted for war credits and supported uh, the war, and the British Labor Party and British Socialists also supported it, and French Socialists, and, and this was the collapse of the Second International. And Vladimir Lenin, uh, who was in Russia, who had the Bolshevik movement, he declared that the Second International was a stinking corpse. And they were filled with outrage. And Rosa Luxemburg, Eugene Debs here in the United States, there was many people in the socialist movement that were furious about the socialist parties that had sworn they would never support World War I, changing their position and supporting the First World War. And, you know, Lenin blamed it on labor aristocracy. And he said, look, the fact was the German Social Democratic Party, even though it talked a good game and all of that, at the end of the day, it was dominated by wealthy, well, not wealthy, but well-paid industrial workers who identified with German imperialism. And Lenin said that the revolution was going to come from the developing world, from countries where people were being kept deeply poor, not from the first world at that point, because of this, this stratification. And he called on serious revolutionaries to not organize the labor aristocracy, but to go what he called lower and deeper among the more impoverished and oppressed workers. So World War I 
was raging. 1917, you have the Bolsheviks come to power in Russia. And then in 1918, you have the November Revolution in Germany, right? World War I has ended, there's an armistice already. So the German Kaiser told his soldiers, or uh, told the Navy, to go and commit a suicide mission, right? To just basically go die, you know, just, just, just all die before the war is over, have a glorious, glorious death. And the German Navy, they thought, okay, the war's already over, we've already surrendered on the land, they refused to do it, and they shot their officers. And you had an uprising all throughout Germany where workers rose up and workers' councils were formed, and from, from November of 1918 until January, it was a council of people's deputies, it was a Soviet, basically, a workers' council that ran Germany. And it was led by members of the Social Democratic Party and of the Independent Social Democratic Party, which was a party that had split, that had opposed the war. So you have a revolutionary government coming in. The, the Kaiser steps down. And so the question is, is Germany going to write a socialist constitution and join the Soviet Union and become a socialist country? Or is Germany going to write a capitalist constitution and just allow the socialists to run in, in elections? And Rosa Luxemburg and Karl Liebknecht, they formed an organization called Spartacus Bund, uh, or Spartacus League. And that was a group of people who wanted to build a Soviet Republic in Germany. And they declared in Bavaria, the Bavarian Soviet Republic. But the majority of the social democratic leaders instead wrote a capitalist constitution. And in February, they wrote the Weimar Constitution. They created the Weimar Republic, right? And they created a capitalist constitution. But it was socialists who came to power in a workers' revolution at the end of World War I that created a German capitalist government. And at that moment, that discredited Marxism to Europe in a lot of ways. They had their moment, they had their revolution, and they still managed to uh, wrench defeat out of the jaws of victory. Um, it, it, was, it was amazing, people couldn't believe it. Now some people say, well, okay, the war had just ended, the population was weary, perhaps if they had tried to write a socialist constitution, the war would have continued, and France and Britain and the United States would have all invaded. But how realistic is that with Russia already being on the side? You know, it, it, it was a moment of opportunism where Marxists and socialists seized power in a revolution and created capitalism. And that was the moment in which you had the Bolsheviks in Russia calling for the creation of the Third International, or the Communist International. It was a new international they created. And we should talk a little bit about Bolshevism. Right? Lenin's party in Russia, you had the main Marxist party in Russia, which was the Russian Social Democratic Labor Party. But Bolshevism was a different kind of political movement. In 1903, Lenin called for the creation of what he called a party of new type. And it was at a meeting in exile in London. He said they, instead of forming just a regular Marxist party, they should form a party of a new type that would have what he called democratic centralism, meaning that every member was obligated to carry out every decision. Uh, and the party of new type wouldn't be for the majority of people, it would be only for those who were willing to give the whole of their lives to the revolutionary movement. And the party of new type uh, would engage in agitation to the broad masses of people and propaganda to the advanced, right? Whenever there was a disagreement or a strike or a protest, they would agitate and try to create a bigger confrontation. And then they would pick out the smartest people who were capable of becoming communists and propagate Marxism to them and teach them Marxism. And it, was a, it, and it comes from a whole tradition that they had in Russia, like secret societies and, and revolutionary organizations. You're talking about the Decemberists, you can talk about the old believers, right? And that, at that point, 60% of Russia's population was illiterate. And in 1917, it worked, right? The, the, the Tsar was brought down, and later in October, the Bolsheviks came to power. The Party of New Type was a very effective model of organizing in Russia in 1917, and it ultimately came to power. And so, around the world, the Marxists who supported the Russian Revolution formed the Third International. It was convened in 1919. Um, and, you know, at the Second Congress, Lenin laid out his 21 points for membership in the Third International. There were 21 principles you had to believe in in order to be a party in the Second International. Amid, there were various parties in the United States that tried to join, but they didn't believe in the 21 points. You have the Communist Party of the United States coming into being as a party that accepts the 21 points. South Africa, their Communist Party, originally had racism in its manifesto and white supremacy. Well, they said, you can't join that. It's not part of the 21 points. They had to form a new party that was anti-racist. Um, and the Communist International forums, they have their international gatherings in Moscow, and they're attempting to form what they call the United Front. And the idea is that after the Russian Revolution, all these 
second international social democratic parties are in an anti-communist frenzy. They're telling people, oh my gosh, the, the communists are the worst thing ever. This is why people don't believe in socialism is because of those evil reds. They're, called, they're banning communists from labor unions. They're doing everything they can to, to just, just you know, outlaw communists. So Lenin is saying to form the United Front. Let's have a, a day of protest for an eight-hour work day for just basic things and try to get the social democrats and the anarchists to join with us. You know, unity, unity of action, disagreement on principles. Maybe we don't agree ideologically, but let's try to have united fronts around basic demands, freeing political prisoners, eight-hour work days, forming unions. So Lenin's urging communists to form united fronts. Lenin dies in 1924. Um, you have the emergence of Trotskyism as a political movement. And the Trotskyists are saying the Soviet Union, the Soviet Union exists simply as a temporary holdout in a global revolution. They call for permanent revolution. And most of the people in the Soviet Union don't want to have a permanent revolution. They want to start raising the living standards. They've been having civil war, they've been blockaded, they're starving, they're hungry, right? The Communist International thinks that it's best to support uh, the KMT and the nationalist movement in China, Dr. Sun Yat-sen. Trotsky says, oh, no, 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 only the working class, only communists can make the revolution, so he's, he's opposed to that. So the Communist International repudiates Trotskyism, kicks out Leon Trotsky, rejects the theory of permanent revolution. Um, that's 1928. And then you have Bukharin, who comes into existence. And Bukharin is saying that, okay, right, obviously there's not going to be a communist revolution around the world anytime soon. So we'll sign treaties with the West, and we'll try to keep Russia as capitalist as possible, right? And try to get foreign investment to come in. So he's the right opposition. Trotsky is called the left opposition. Bukharin is the right opposition. Both of them are defeated. Stalin comes in. They have the Sixth World Congress of the Communist International, and at the Sixth World Congress, they declare they declare class against class, and they declare that. The history since the Russian Revolution has been divided into three periods. There's the first period, which is the, the aftermath of the Russian Revolution. There's the second period, it's about the 1920s, the Roaring Twenties, capitalist stabilization. But in 1928, they're already seeing the Great Depression on the horizon, and they declare, now we've entered the third period. And in the third period, they say the main enemy is not capitalism, it's social democrats, because they prevented the revolution. And that social democrats are socialist in word, but fascist in deed. They're social fascists. So you have the communist parties of the world fighting against social democrats on the basis of that they are social fascists, that they're the main reason you don't have a revolution. And the Great Depression hits, and you have communists you know, leading huge demonstrations of the unemployed. International Unemployment Day, March 6th, 1931. In every major country in Western Europe and in the Soviet Union, thousands of people are marching, demanding the right to jobs and housing. You have the communists uh, you know, leading things like the bonus march in Washington, D.C., demanding veterans' benefits be paid. You have these unemployed councils, organizations, almost like workers' councils or Soviets of the unemployed being formed. And you have massive communist parties you know, really booming and coming to existence all across Europe. But then, what happens in response? Germany, you have Hitler comes in. He's a fascist, and he's you know, killing communists and putting them in concentration camps, right? And you have a rise of fascist movements all over Europe that are saying, okay, to, to preserve capitalism, we need to have an authoritarian police state that kills, kills communists and exterminates the threat of Marxism. So then you have the Seventh World Congress of the Communist International, in which they say, okay, now it's time for communists to lead the People's Front, or the Popular Front, against fascism. And because we're communists and we have Marxism, we're going to lead the workers of every country against fascism. And so the communists are aligning with social democrats and anti-fascist united fronts. In the United States, that came in the form of supporting Roosevelt and the formation of popular fronts. And then World War II breaks out. The socialist countries of the world are aligned with the Soviet Union and with the United States and Britain against Hitler. And in 1942, they dissolve the Communist International. And the Trotskyists, who have at that point formed their fourth international, they declare that this is a betrayal that shows that Stalin has betrayed the revolution. But Mao Zedong in China, he comments on the dissolving of the Communist International. This is what he said. He says, um, he says, uh, the Communist International, which is far removed from the concrete struggle in each country, was adapted to the relatively simple conditions of the past when changes took place rather slowly, but it is a no longer suitable instrument. He said, for some time, it has been felt that the centralized organization of an international character was not very appropriate for rapidly organizing. 
Uh, leading cadres of the Communist parties of various countries have already grown and attained political maturity. Um, and he basically says that, you know, sen oh, he says, since the Seventh World Congress of the Communist International in 1935, the Communist International has not intervened in the internal affairs of the Chinese Communist Party, meaning that the Communist International had really kind of stopped being a thing anymore. You know, the Communist parties around the world had grown, it expanded, and then they weren't, you know, Moscow wasn't trying to coordinate their activity at that point. So after the Second World War, you have all these countries across Eastern Europe that are becoming socialist countries. They call them people's democracies, but eventually that moves towards socialism. And you have the birth of China, People's Republic in 1949. So in 1948, Yugoslavia denounces the Soviet Union. And Yugoslavia announces the Soviet Union is internally meddling in their affairs, and it's unacceptable. And all of a sudden, all the Western capitalist countries love Yugoslavia. That was the first divide. 1956, you have the 20th Party Congress of the USSR. Stalin has died, a new Party Congress in the Soviet Union. Khrushchev comes in and gives the infamous secret speech in which he accuses Stalin of every awful, dirty thing under the sun. Um, you know, and what's interesting about it is Khrushchev's secret speech, a lot of what he's saying is that Stalin is this anti-imperialist revolutionary, but I, don't worry, I love the Western capitalists. A lot of the speech focuses on trying to say that Stalin was was weak during the Second World War and that he was a coward, right? He claims that Stalin, when he heard Hitler had invaded, he just sobbed and hid under his desk and all of that. And of course, Stalin is a, was a professional bank robber who walked into banks with a gun. I really don't think he was hiding under his desk and crying. But the secret speech was really Khrushchev groveling before the Western imperialists and saying, don't worry, don't worry, I'm not a bad guy like Stalin. I'm not a revolutionary. Khrushchev announces that people around the world shouldn't fight Western imperialism because the USA has the atomic bomb and the danger of atomic war is too great. So he calls for, he says, peaceful coexistence between capitalism and socialism. People in the developing world who are fighting for their national liberation, well, they have to call it off. World war is too dangerous. They call it detente, right, between the United States and the Soviet Union. Well, China disagrees with that. Um, China says that, no, this is a, a violation, and they recuse the, the USSR of being revisionist, right? That Edward Bernstein word. They say that they're revisionist. They're selling out the revolution. China presents itself as the center of world revolution. 1966, you have China launching the Cultural Revolution, uh, which is an attempt to drive what they call capitalist rotors out of the party. Um, and Cuba, North Korea, there's various countries around the world that are neutral you know, between China and the Soviet Union. The only country that blatantly sides with China is Albania, right? But, but Cuba is neutral. It's friendly to China and the Soviet Union. North Korea is neutral. A lot of countries are neutral. Albania is solidly with, with China. So then in 1969, you have the fall of a very prominent leader in the Chinese Communist Party named Lin Biao. And Lin Biao, it's not clear what happened. I guess the official story is that he was on a plane trying to flee to the Soviet Union after he tried to kill Mao or something. It's not clear what happened. After the fall of Lin Biao, you see a dramatic shift in Chinese foreign policy. It starts out in Angola, where China is aligning with the CIA to, to fight against the pro-Soviet Communist Party of Angola. Uh, you have the rise of the Gang of Four in China, which are four party leaders, including Mao's wife. They published what they call the Theory of Three Worlds, which is the idea that, that the Soviet Union and the United States are the first world, Europe is the second world, and there's the third world, and China is going to lead the third world against both of those countries. Later, they announced the Soviet Union is the main danger to the people of the world, um, and they're, they're urging communists around the world to fight against the Soviet Union. Uh, you have the Vietnam War. After the Vietnam War, you have the Camp Ushia War, very famous, right? And the Camp Ushia War is an instance where Vietnam has, you know, the United States has withdrawn from Vietnam. Vietnam is a Soviet-aligned country. Then you have Pol Pot, the leader of Camp Ushia, who is calling himself a Maoist and is aligned with China. And so Pol Pot and Vietnam have a war. The United States is covertly sending weapons and guns to Pol Pot. Pol Pot is claiming that, that, that you know, Vietnam is a colony of the Soviet social imperialists. China and the USA are supporting Pol Pot. The Soviet Union is supporting Vietnam. And you have thousands of communists killing other communists in an ugly, destructive mess that's really fomented by Brzezinski. And it's fomented by the West. The US intelligence agencies figured, OK, we couldn't defeat the communists with our own with our own method of mass bombing and killing. So what we can do is we can manipulate and get communists killing other communists. 1978, you have the formation of, of Euro-communism, where the Italian Communist Party, the French Communist Party, the Communist Party of Spain have a convention and denounce the Soviet Union. And you have Brzezinski, 
in the United States, the National Security Advisor Carter praising them and saying, well, we like the Euro communists. The United States likes the Euro communists. It doesn't like the Soviet communists, it doesn't like the Chinese communists. We like the Euro communists. So this is the international communist movement. And let me add that there's also the fourth internationals, right? We don't want to forget that. that there are, at this point, I believe there are, there are six different Trotskyist fourth internationals that are keeping the flame of Trotskyism going. Um, you know, you still have the International Meeting of Communist and Workers' Parties that takes place, I believe, every few years. Uh, you have the World Festival of Youth and Students, which is a gathering of communist and, and socialist and anti-imperialist youth organizations. I've been to one. Um, I've, been, I've been to two of them, actually. I know some of the people, the students in Youth and, uh, for a New America, went to the recent one. Um, you have the World Federation of Trade Unions, which is an alliance of communist trade unions. You have the Women's International Democratic Federation, which is an alliance, international alliance of communist uh, women's organizations. And let's not forget you have Maoists, right? People who think that, that you know, the Soviet Union became capitalist and are holding on to that line of the Gang of Four and Mao. You have followers of Enver Hoxha who think that, you know, that Albania was the one true socialist country. Um, often they'll have names like the Communist Party, Marxist-Leninist, as opposed to the Communist Party. Um, and that's, that's where the communist movement is at. But I want to end this section by pointing out, you know, the Cuban Revolution was led by Fidel Castro. Was Fidel Castro a member of the Communist Party? No. His brother, Raul, was a member of the Communist Party, but the Communist Party told him not to participate in his brother's revolution, and he did it anyway. The July 26 movement that created the Cuban Revolution was not part of the international communist movement. Let me add that. Hugo Chavez, was he a member of the Communist Party? No, he was not. The Bolivarian movement was an independent socialist movement. The Communist Party eventually supported it, but he was not part of it. Part of it. Michel Aflaq, the creator of Baathist Arab Socialism, was not part of the Syrian Communist Party. In fact, it was, it was his independent movement that broke with the Communist Party that brought socialism to Syria and Iraq and elsewhere. Mao Zedong, interestingly, had been an anarchist prior to joining the Communist Party and becoming a founding member. He had an organization called the New People's Study Society uh, that he led, and they followed the teachings of Peter Kropotkin. And they weren't really interested in Marxism because China was a majority peasant country. And so Marxism was about factory workers fighting the bosses. That didn't really apply to China. But Kropotkin's theory about the peasantry fighting to seize its land appealed to Mao, who was organizing in China. Now, when the Bolshevik Revolution happened, he ended up you know, joining the Communist Party at its founding Congress. But Mao originally had been his own separate grouping that was inspired by Peter Kropotkin's anarchism. And even Bolshevism. Uh, the Leninist movement was not part of the mainstream of global Marxism. They were not part of the Second International. They were a dissident party that had their party of new type theory and their different organization and different ideas about imperialism. You talked about Kautsky's theory of ultra-imperialism. That was the main view within the Second International. Lenin's theory of imperialism was a separate theory. The, the Bolsheviks were also kind of independent of the global Marxist movement. So that raises the question, and I'll end this section by raising the question, what is the significance of the international Marxist movement, and what can we learn from it, and what can we not learn from it? So I'll end with that. On that note, we'll begin our, our third Q&A. If anyone wants to respond to this question, maybe give their own perspective, or clarify what Caleb just spoke about in this third section. Yes? Um, obviously, the many currents of left uh, anti-imperial, anti-capitalist activism. Um, and it's very interesting to note as well that there are many currents of fascism, neo-fascism. And this is an issue which is very much current to today because it's very clear that the United States is going in that direction. It is going towards an, an unprecedented level of militarism, a new imperialism at a, at a scale unknown before in the history of humanity. What, the United States has what? Uh, 800 bases around the world, 150 countries. And uh, military spending is bigger than probably the, the, uh, the, the, the economy of, of three quarters of the countries in the world to get to militarism. How does, how does the left react to that? What can be done to use an off corner phrase? No. Um, how is that impacting in the, the current situation of, of, of Marxist and other left wing movements? That's the, that's the theme of my final presentation. So. Okay. But what, what, what do people have on the, the section we just went over? Um, it, it talks about social democracy, and we'll turn it into a question, but like social democracy, I think nowadays is very misunderstood because people think of, think of it as like, you know, Scandinavian countries where 
or even some of the other European countries, which are capitalist countries that have, you know, a high marginal tax rate on on the wealthy and strong welfare state and a lot of public services, but they're still capitalist countries and they're aligned with NATO and aligned with the US. Uh, but if you have to read the writings of the Social Democrats, like in the Air Force program, like, and, um, or in the Swedish Social, Social Democrats, that, that was not their goal. Like they, their goal, they were Marxists, and their goal was that um, you know the proletariat should take power. Just like they, they just, you know, um, and they didn't believe in that there would be a single revolution. That there would be an evolutionary process where you know capitalists kind of die. You strengthen the working class power. It's more you. It was more than just voting, you know, that there were supporters of unions and strikes and so forth, but they build power in the working class and the capitalism just sort of like collapsed on its own. Um, so, but, you know, my question though is, you know, were they completely wrong? Because if you, um, I, think, I think Bernstein's argument was that, um, you know, when you have a society like Germany at the time, which was a pros relatively prosperous society, that the 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 workers, they they you know they don't have what they really should have in a social society, but they still have something. They're not going to give that up and revolt. But they're not going you know, you have a revolution in Russia because their people's backs were against the wall. World, the war was going on. There's no way to stop it. You know. Um, so, but if you look at like I, I think the United States and the European countries still resemble more Germany at that time than they do Russia or China. And there has not been anything close to um, a, a, a Ru Russian-type re revolution in, in any of those countries. You talked about 1918, which is the closest, or maybe the second closest was in in France in 1968. But even that kind of fizzled out, right? So, um, but then the Socialist Party of Germany was huge, right? They, you know, they're very, you know, um, so, um, you know, do. Do we need to kind of like maybe look, rethink the Bernstein argument and say like, do we like um, do what we can to, to build a movement? Um, but I understand it's going to be a protracted process. So it's going to take a long time to be evolutionary. Right, who else? You had said in the second part that um, the difference between. Um, a uh, utopian socialist and a um, scientific socialist that um, Marx um, first established was that um, the utopians believed that societal change came from the thoughts in their heads and like stuff like that, whereas the scientific was like looking at the material conditions. And from my perspective, as you were describing like the movements that um, succeeded versus where they started to go wrong or where the movements that failed, it seemed to be exactly that was the case that the movements that more focused on the material conditions of like the people and like interacting with them like ended up winning out whereas like you had um things like the Trotskyites whereas like they had this idea of permanent revolution that they want to impose on the world instead of looking at the world as it was so I think that's um at least from my perspective that seems to be how it is Um, well, I guess I would just uh, touch on um, when I used ultra imperialism earlier. Um, I didn't. I didn't mean that. You know, the uh, 1910 or whenever Kautsky wrote it, you know, was ap the applicable applicable to today. Um, it's more just the uh, idea of combination of the imperialist forces of, uh, especially after um, World War II. You know, they, they combined the U.S., NATO, and their allies. You know, the world contradiction was around um, the capitalist bloc versus the socialist bloc. Um, after the fall of the Soviet Union and the Eastern Bloc, it, it was essentially just one imperialist bloc. And even up until today, there's still really only one imperialist bloc. I mean, USA alone has 23 aircraft carriers. France has two, has four. UK has two, Russian Federation has one, PRC has one. Like, what kind of global power can these countries exert? The idea of calling them imperial, I know you don't, but I, the idea of calling them imperialist powers is ridiculous. I just think it's funny that 
you know, for the time in 1915, Lenin's idea of imperialism was absolutely correct. You know, there was competing imperialist powers. But then after 1991, it's almost like Kowski's view of ultra-imperialism with the combination of these countries and their military alliances actually kind of panned out to be the case, you know, by de facto in a way. Well, I, I think you know, to respond to that, um, if you take if you take a look at just the military power, right? I think that's kind of uh, I think that's kind of like the superstructure. I think what the base is is the U.S. dollar dominance of the global financial system, right? Like none of these countries can escape from that system. None of the countries in the West, even countries in the you know the anti-imperialist camp, right? Like even China and Russia have difficulties completely decoupling themselves from that system. Uh, it's it's so powerful right now. But that's not to say that there's not an end point to it. You know, everything has an end point, right? And I think that's probably the, the collapse of the Western dollar, uh, dollar dominated financial system. I think that's ultimately going to be I, the, the single biggest crisis moment for capitalism in the world. And I think it's probably coming. In the next, in the next, I don't know, maybe 15, 20, 30 years, mm -hmm. especially with the rise of China, yeah. um, and I mean, the, the, it's very much, you know, an explicit goal uh, of the Communist Party of China that they want to, uh, they want to replace the dollar. They want to use their energy to replace the dollar one day. I mean, they don't go around like advertising it, but everybody, like everybody there, right? Everybody in China knows. That's ultimately the goal because until you get to that point, that's why they have very tight currency export, capital export controls because they know as soon as you open up your currency to you know be freely convertible, and that's like the U.S. is trying to get them to do that, very you know like trying hard, right, slapping titles like currency manipulator, whatever. But they're not going to do that because they know as soon as you open up your currency, that's it, like. The dollar's gonna come in, and it's gonna wipe you out, it's gonna take out whatever fiscal independence you ever had. So they're waiting, the, the, only, the only situation where they would allow the RMB to float, right, to, to be freely exchanged, is, it, is when it feels like, when China feels like it has enough uh, economic power and financial power to withstand attacks and, and even defeat the dollar. And I think that day's coming, you know, you see China signing more and more currency swap deals with other countries, you know, just like anything else. Currency is it, a commodity, right? It, it, there's supply and demand. The reason why the dollar is so valuable, the reason why we can keep printing this, what would otherwise be useless pieces of paper, is because there's demand for it, because everybody believes that it has value, right? But once that belief evaporates, then like, I, I, I do not think that our current uh, Financial fiscal policies in this country are sustainable, right? I mean, that's ever since 1970, the, all the growth, all the GDP growth in this country has been financed through debt. Like, literally, you need to borrow money for everything these days, right? You need to borrow money, buy a house, buy a car, uh, go to school, go to college, right? Uh, to pay your medical bills, to buy even personal necessities, right? You have a credit card for that, you know? It's, it once we no longer have the ability to print money, it's not just going to be us. It's all the countries that rely, all the Western countries that rely on this system, it's 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 gonna it's gonna I mean it's gonna be worse than the Great Depression. It's gonna be a lot worse. So why don't I address these points in my concluding remarks, and then we can open up for as long as we have the place till ten, so we can keep going. You know, but I'm just gonna make my concluding remarks. Does that sound good? All right. Cool. So for the final section, I didn't talk about conclusions. I want to talk about, first of all, who I am, right? Now, some of you know me, you follow me on social media or whatever, but so, you know, I'm from a really small town in Ohio originally. I got interested in communism on my own. No one in my family was a communist. I never, you know, I know people that grew up and their parents were in the Communist Party or in SDS or something. That's not my background at all. I got interested in communism on my own. Got interested in it, started looking for communist groups. When I was in college, I ended up, you know, I was looking around at one group, and I ended up with one particular group that I was with for about eight years. 
And, you know, I was with that group during the rise of President Barack Obama. He got elected. Um, I ended up moving to New York City around the time of the Occupy Wall Street protests in 2011. Um, it, was, it was a few months beforehand, but I was in New York City, and one thing that really kind of had an impact on me was the Libyan War, because this party I was with, to their credit, consistently anti-imperialist. They opposed any U.S. imperialist operation. They never supported any military interventions. And at the time, I was very opposed to the bombing of Libya. And what also bothered me as an Occupy Wall Street activist was that, that the Libyan revolution was being framed as if it was part of the Occupy protest movement. And I, I knew that this was the USA trying to tear down an independent country. And so I went and I studied the Green Book. If folks ever heard of the Green Book? That's Gaddafi's manifesto. And I read it. And I read it. And I looked into Libya's constitution and legal system. And I said, Libya is a socialist country. Right? In fact, I would say that there's, it's, 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 its model is closer to really existing socialism in Libya than China is. My party maintained that China was a socialist country. But yet, when I would approach the pe people in my party about Libya, they said, Libya is a bourgeois nationalist regime. And I said, why? And they would proceed to explain to me that in socialism, the workers control the means of production. And I would say, yeah, but I think in Libya, where they have these popular assemblies, and they'd say, yeah, but they don't. That's just propaganda from Gaddafi. And I would say, but can you, can you show me the, the economic difference between Gaddafi's Libya and socialist Cuba or China? Well, no, no, no. One, and it really, the more I pressed them, the more I realized they didn't really know. And, and on top of that, the answer they gave really boiled down to Fidel Castro calls himself a Marxist-Leninist. The Chinese Communist Party call themselves Marxist-Leninists. Gaddafi calls himself an Islamic Socialist. He hasn't said the right magic words, I'm a Marxist-Leninist, therefore Libya is a capitalist country and, and China and Cuba are socialist countries. And I couldn't accept that because that's... That's not Marxism, right? Reality is not defined by people having ideas in their head. It's defined by material economic realities. And the economic reality of Libya, a country where the major means of production are controlled by the state, it's a planned economy, you have these like little Soviet things they call popular committees. Libya was a socialist country, as far as I could tell. They couldn't give me really an answer about it. And what was weird is I had come to this conclusion totally on my own, right? You know, factionalism is not permitted in socialist groups. They tend to be very strict about that. But as my life continued, I met people in the Michigan, younger people my age, in the Michigan wing of my party who felt this way. And I met people here in New York who were not in the party I was in, but they also had come to similar conclusions. And I discovered that among the younger people, we all kind of had the same question. What's, what's going on here? And I'll never forget the day I was in Zuccotti Park, the day that Gaddafi was killed. Right? I was in the Occupy Wall Street Park in 2011, the day that Gaddafi was killed. And there was a Trotskyite group there selling their newspaper, and there were some anarchist groups there. And they all were indifferent. And their attitude was, well, Gaddafi was a brutal bourgeois nationalist dictator, he was a tyrant, well, you know, he deserved it, he oppressed people, he was sexist or homophobic. But what I thought was weird was there was a lot of people in that park who were not Marxists and not socialists, but they were just kind of working class young people who bust in, some of them were like fans of Alex Jones, some of them were libertarians. And they all said what you just said about Gaddafi's trying to fight for an African bank and he's trying to create an independent currency. And I thought, this is weird. Why do I have more in common with non-Marxists than with the Marxist movement? And that pointed me to realize that there was something wrong with the organized political left. And there was something wrong with that family tree I just, you know, it's the first international and the second international and the Trotsky, and, and every communist group can trace its origins back to a split from a split from a split. And made me realize there was something wrong with that. And eventually my journalism career began to expand. I started traveling around the world and speaking at international conferences, and I'm no longer with that political organization I was with. Um, but I've come to the conclusion that, that socialism is not a religion. Socialism is a tool. During the 20th century, socialism was a tool that countries that were kept in chronic poverty by imperialism utilized to industrialize and raise their people out of poverty. And that now in the area of accumulation through destruction, we need to start talking to the people of the United States about utilizing socialism to get out of the crisis that we're in. I see socialism as a tool, not as an ideology, not as a religion, not as a faith, but as a tool. And that it's a tool that people in the United States should be engaged about using to get out of the crisis. And I noticed one thing I wanted to add is, you know, during the time of feudalism, 
a lot of the way that the bourgeoisie organized to bring down feudalism was they had secret societies, right? The Freemasons and the Illuminati and the, the, the Knights Templar, and these were like secret societies. And, you know, if you talk about Freemasonry, what do the Freemasons believe? Well, it's all on the internet now, but you're not supposed to know it, right? It's like you're supposed to join and pay them lots of money, and after two or three years, they tell you a little bit more, and then after two or three years, they tell you a little bit more. And then finally, you find out what they believe. It's kind of like the Church of Scientology. It's a very similar model, right? You, know, you join Scientology, it's just supposed to be like some kind of weird therapy, self-help. And after you've been in for 20 years and pay enough money, they tell you all about the space alien. And that the way communist groups are organized, more or less, the way they're intended to function, is a lot like Freemasonry or the Church of Scientology. The, the way the group I was in functioned, it was, under, it, was, it was assumed that average people would never be convinced of communism. So the idea was we would form an organization that was protesting against the war. We'd find, find an organization that was protesting against police brutality. And we would organize protests around it. And then we would kind of whisper to people, you know, there's this group that, that we're part of that, that, that can tell you what things are really about. We pick the best, and then they would join. And it was bizarre, because in the age of information technology, all these people knew exactly what we believed. They'd read our Wikipedia page, so it was pretty silly. But it was that Masonic style, right? That, that we're, 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 we're not gonna tell you what we really believe. And you know, the main critique that most people that were familiar with the organization I was in was that the group defended North Korea. And there was this assumption that if we just protested enough with these people, they would come to like us and be our friends, and then eventually we could get them into a group that supported North Korea. And the response of these people was generally, I don't agree with you about North Korea. And again, it's kind of like this, this Masonic Scientology way of organizing. It's, it's if, you, if you suck somebody in and they've paid money over years and you finally tell them something after years and years and it's become their whole social circle and you finally get to that point, they'll believe anything. You know, you know what I'm saying? Like, like, that's the whole thing. It's not a persuasive argument, right? And I think that this, this way of organizing on the assumption that average people can't be convinced Right? That, that, uh, that, that it has to be done in this very clandestine way. It almost reminds you of like Tom Sawyer, right? You know, communist groups, they all have their fake name. I can't tell you my real name. My real name is Joe Stevenson. Or, you know, you know, you know, or, you know and then you almost want to expect them to like pull out decoder rings or, you know, it, it's almost kind of silly uh, the way that they're organizing. And at the same time, it's all based on this assumption that average people can't be convinced of socialism. And the truth is, have you looked at the polls that are coming out? Have you looked at the rise of Bernie Sanders? Average people can be convinced of socialism. And this Freemason model of organizing that was very effective in Tsarist Russia in 1913, it was very effective for the, the feudal, uh, you know, fighting against feudalism for the early bourgeoisie at a time where you could be burned at the stake for believing that the earth was not the center of the universe. That was a very effective way of doing things. But now, we live in an era of information technology, where information is so widely available, if anything, now necessitates socialist agitation more than ever. I wanted to add also that I came across the writings of a very brilliant man who died a couple of years ago named Nelson Peary. And he was a leader of, he was in the Communist Party, eventually he had an organization, he was a Maoist with the Communist Labor Party. I'm not going to endorse his organization or, or whatever is left of it, but he wrote a very beautiful book called The Future is Up to Us. And in that book, he critiques, he critiques Marxism, and he makes two very interesting points. So when we talk about the historical narrative of you know, hunter-gatherer civilization, slavery, feudalism, capitalism, capitalism leading to socialism, he points out that feudalism wasn't brought down by the peasants rising up. It wasn't, right? The peasants did rise up all throughout feudalism. There were many peasant revolts. There were Ger in Germany and Britain, all kinds of places. That never led to the overthrow of feudalism. Feudalism was not overthrown by peasants. It was overthrown by the mercantile classes. And they were not part of feudalism, right? And it was them who overthrew it, a class that was not part of the feudal system. And why were they able to actually overthrow feudalism? All these peasant revolts that happened, they would maybe seize power for 100 years, and then the feudal system would, would take it over, right? The peasants would seize power, and they'd hold power for a little while longer. They'd reorganize the, the peasant communes in a more egalitarian way, but then eventually feudalism would retake them because they had the same mode of production, right? But the reason the mercantile class was able to overthrow feudalism is because they represented a higher mode of production. They were not the feudal mode of production reorganized in a different way. They were a different mode of production. It was capitalism. It was production for profit. It was global trade. 
overturning feudalism. And Nelson Peary, in this book, The Future is Up to Us, he makes the analogy of the Soviet Union. Right? The Soviet Union had the same mode of production as the capitalist world, just organized differently. They had steel mills that were the same as American steel mills. They had textile factories that were the same as British textile factories. They just organized them in a state central plan, but it was still the same mode of production. It's the same mode of production organized differently. And so then he argues in his book that rather than it being a reorganization of capitalist mode of production, that the overturn of capitalism requires a new mode of production that it would have to be a new mode of production to defeat the old mode of production. He talks about a revolution happening in three stages. He says first there's an economic revolution with a new mode of production. Next there's a social revolution of a new class that comes into existence to go with that new mode of production. And then third you have a political revolution where that new class seizes power. And that that's how revolutions tend to happen. And then that points to the computer revolution. right? Karl Marx talks about workers being reduced to being appendages of machines. Under feudalism, they're, they're skilled craftsmen. They're, they're, they're carving wood in their own way. They're doing art and it has this spiritual character. But under, under capitalism, they're just appendages to machines, working the assembly line, churning things out. But now, at this point, with artificial intelligence, we're getting machines with very, very, very few appendages. Right? Jack Ma talks about how we used to work really hard to make people like machines, but now we have machines that are like people, right? And that we're at the point where any role of people in production is increasingly being reduced. And we're also at the point where we see people making profits from corporations, not with their labor. Facebook is a great example. If you get on Facebook, right? You post, hey, I was just at Caleb's class, it was awesome, he blew my mind. You're making money for Mark Zuckerberg by doing that. But you're not working. You're having a good time, right? You, and that there are all these ways in which people are generating wealth in ways that is not selling their labor power. And that we have a new mode of production. And as I said before, self-driving cars would be a very, very good thing in a socialist society. Less work for everybody. But in capitalism, it leads people without. It leaves people, and the necessity for people coming together and seizing control of the means of production and forcing these high-tech machines that don't have appendages or have very few appendages, the necessity for that is growing. And then people talk about the new class of workers whose ability to sell their labor is drastically reduced, right? How many assembly line factory workers are there these days, right? And increasingly, there's not a role for millions of people in the means of production. And I think this all points toward the way out and the problem that we're in. And I also want to emphasize, and I've emphasized many times, the importance of a pamphlet that Karl Marx wrote called The 18th Brumiere of Louis Bonaparte. And he talks about how France in 1851 was in the middle of a crisis, and wages were dropping, and people were suffering, and the workers were rising up, and there were revolts and protests. And so Louis Bonaparte, who was the, the nephew of, of Napoleon Bonaparte, seized power and created a, a, an authoritarian military dictatorship. And he seized power on behalf of one section of the capitalists. And what he did was he used the state to suppress another section. He was for the finance capitalists and the farmers against the factory owners. So one section of the ruling class seizes control of the government and then uses the state to suppress other capitalists in the hope of restoring order. He actually called his military junta the party of order. Right? And, and that happens when, when the, the rate of profit is dropping, when the capitalists are not making profits, when there's instability in society, when there's uprisings and protests. One section of the capitalist class violently seizes power and tries to violently seize control of the state in order to end the crisis. But of course, the other sections of the ruling class don't want that because it's that, you know, every capitalist wants the crisis to go away. They just want the other capitalists to be the ones that have to pay for it. And so divisions within the ruling class are becoming more and more of a reality. And, and in the past, in the lead up to World War I and World War II, these divisions played out as countries div divided. But I think what we're seeing now is we're seeing capitalists that are not loyal to each other. They're, they're interplaying. For example, like, like the Obama administration seemed very tied in with Europe. 
the Trump administration seems very opposed to an alliance with Europe. However, you'll notice there are capitalists in Europe that are very friendly to Trump. Trump, the pro-Brexit wing of British capital, was very friendly to Trump. Right? Uh, the, the, the new right of Europe seems very friendly to Trump. Uh, the, the Obama wing of American capital uh, seems more friendly to the, the liberals and moderates in Europe. And we're seeing alliances of capitalists developing all across the capitalist world, and these alliances are not on the basis of na nation state. It's not, the, the, the entire American capitalist ruling class is not behind the US government and its policies. And that there are divisions between capitalists, but they're not playing out on a national level. Just like we're seeing China's you know, One Belt, One Road initiative, and we're seeing that it's making inroads in countries not specific to the country. There are sections of Nigeria that are loyal to China and part of this One Belt, One Road initiative. There are also big sections of Nigeria that are with the United States. And the nation state as the deciding factor is not exactly clear. So we're in a period where it seems like the capitalists are fighting amongst themselves, but the people are also suffering immensely and trying to organize and trying to figure out a way out of this. And what happens when you have Bonapartism is the ruling class, sections of it, begin recruiting workers as their foot soldiers to beat down other workers and to beat down other sections of the ruling class. And that tends to be how it's done. And if you'll look at all the revolutions of history, they started out this way. The Russian Revolution began as the ruling class, the capitalists of Russia, deposing the Tsar because he was losing the war. And then it turned into a fight between the, the capitalists of Russia that were tied in with Germany and wanted to, wanted to end World War I, that were aligned with the Bolsheviks, and the capitalists of Russia that wanted to continue the war and were tied in with American capital. It was a fight among the, the ruling capitalist class, a Bonapartist struggle, that then led to the working class taking power. And the, you know what happened in China, the Chinese Revolution played out that way. The Cuban Revolution played out that way. Bolivarianism very much played out that way. These fights among the ruling class lay the basis for the working class getting involved in the political process. And I think that that's underestimated. People want to make it, they have a glorious kind of propaganda narrative of the revolutions, that one day the people just couldn't take it anymore and they went out in the street. That's not, that's propaganda. You know, I, I'm paying close attention to Scottish independence right now. So Scottish independence, it seems weird. It's like, you know, and Scottish independence has been around for decades, right? It's just this weird, vague, cultural nationalist movement, right? But Scottish independence has stopped being that. Suddenly it's become an economic issue. It's about the oil and gas in the North Sea, right? The oil and gas that's largely owned by BP, London bankers. At this point, the Scottish independence movement is demanding that that oil and gas be nationalized. And the Scottish independence movement has focused on austerity and cuts in social spending. And it's basically turned, in, turned into a movement where you could say that a lot of wealthy capitalists in Scotland who are losing profits would like to get a subsidy from that North Sea oil and gas. And so they're mobilizing and they're aligning with the working class that doesn't want cuts in the National Health Service and doesn't want cuts uh, in, in education. They're aligning with them to fight against the London ruling class and BP over access to this North Sea oil. And we're seeing a Bonapartist struggle pushing the working class into motion. And it's working class people and it's trade unions that are fighting for Scottish independence and demanding that the Labour Party be more left wing. This kind of thing is happening. This is, this is the reality of what we're seeing. And of course, as sections of the ruling class fight with each other, they're going to be violent to other sections. And they're going to, you know, the kind of consensus and you know, I, Ronald Reagan used to say, we're all friends after six. They're not all friends after six anymore. You can tell that. And they're going to use government repression to try and control not only the working class resisting, but also to control each other. Right? When Donald Trump said during the election he was going to jail Hillary Clinton. Right? Um, you know, I mean, this, this faction around <coughs> Kamala Harris seems very, very committed uh, to, to international wars, and it seems to be kind of the forces that were in Hillary Clinton's State Department trying to seize the White House once again. And the fact that when Bernie Sanders was speaking at a recent DNC meeting, they all walked out as he was speaking, basically making clear they wouldn't support him in a general election. This is all divisions within the ruling class that are playing out. But when these divisions within the ruling class happen, it creates an opening. And I think what really needs to be inserted into the consciousness of the people of the United States is the notion that the government is best, that governs least, that hey, you know, we should just privatize everything. That needs to be gotten rid of. We need to introduce the notion 
that having a government that fights for the people, that works to raise living standards, is something that is completely acceptable. I've raised the slogan before, we need a government of action to fight for working families. But a government of action, a government that will get things done, a government that is dramatic, right? And you can imagine some kind of Bonapartist faction in the United States wanting to help working people and pushing working people into motion to combat other sections. And you can imagine that leading to something exciting in the United States. I mean, this is all hypothetical. I'm just talking off the top of my head. You can imagine it. But at the same time, we need to hold on to the principles of scientific socialism. I wanted to just read an interesting quotation because in, there's, a, there's a speech by Mao Zedong that he gave in 1964. And it's one of the only examples you can find of Mao completely unscripted. He's speaking to a group of students. It's actually published in a book called Chairman Mao Talks to the People, which was edited by Stuart Tram, an intellectual in Britain people think may have been tied to the CIA. But he published this speech that Mao gave in 1964 called Talk on Philosophy. And he talks about all kinds of things. He talks about Benjamin Franklin, and he talks about how he first got interested in Marxism. But this one particular passage stood out to me, and I just want to end my presentation with this. He said, the life of dialectics is the continuous movement toward opposites. Mankind will also finally meet its doom. When theologians talk about doomsday, they are pessimistic, and they terrify people. But we say that the end of mankind is something that will produce something even more advanced than mankind. And mankind is still in its infancy. That was Mao in 1964, and I'll end with that, and we'll have our final discussion. week going to teach on socialism with Chinese characteristics. Introduction. It's going to be a great presentation. I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, and we're all looking forward to it. Um, just so you guys know, this, this class is independently funded, um, mostly by Caleb, but by some of us in the group as well. Um, so as a result, we do ask for donations. They're not required, but they're definitely welcome. Um, just so we pass the hat, um, just, just to cover the cost of the meeting space um, and the cost of materials. We also have copies of Caleb's books for sale up here at the front table, in case anybody's interested. Um, any final comments, questions, discussion points? Yeah, we have the place till 10, so we can go until 10 if you want. I, I return to the question that I had before about uh, the rise of a exponential militarism. And I, I can see your comments on Bonapartism applying perfectly to the rise of National Socialism, aka Nazism in Germany. But it's also applicable to what's for the, the United States in many instances. And I'd also like to uh, comment on the question that of uh, uh, the, the, the virtues of, of, uh, of the electronic age that at the same time, there is an absolute need for, for looking at uh, the people who have been left out of industrialization. Just today I was talking to a group that I'm looking to do a project in Pakistan, rural Pakistan, which implies, which absolutely needs to revive traditional handicraft forms of building, which is a form of knowledge, you know. It's, it, this is something that if you look at many countries throughout the world, is a constant, you know. There are people that are integrated into the economy, integrated into the nation state, and there are the many peoples that are excluded. And they're excluded very happily in some instances, and they're excluded and need to be excluded in the sense of indigenous peoples in the Amazon because they play a role in the way they, they live. You know, it's really not going to save them or help them if they, they're, they're you know, introduced into this, this uh, Facebook international economy in, in, in the classic industrialized sense. Yeah. And of course, the, the, greater, the greater question here for me is how do you, uh, I, I have been, uh, I have lived through several moments of revolutionary action, which just come up, like in Portugal, the Revolution of the Roses, and what's happening in Puerto Rico, where you suddenly have a million plus people, literally a third of the population of the country, manifest themselves on the street for a whole series of issues, which is clearly a revolutionary moment. And, it, and it's not something that can be filled by comments by people say, oh, Puerto Ricans are also American. They are not. And Puerto Rico is an interesting case because there are many nations in the United States 
that have been gobbled up by the Anglo-American imperialism that created this country that persist, like the Lakota Indians and other groups that are defined in a different way. Now, um, how does this feel, a filial model? How can, can the, uh, socialism address the needs of these people for revolutionary change? Which is ultimately the question. And how do we oppose the rise of this new, really exponential militarism of the United States throughout the world? One could say that in terms of, of, of currency, that the reason why there's a, there's a connection between the, uh, the, the reticence of, of multinational capital, especially in the United States, to address climate change, because from the 1970s, when the dollar became the rate of exchange for petroleum, that essentially made petroleum the gold standard of the world. And if you remove petroleum, you no longer have an international economy in their mindset. It just really shows the depth of the challenge in all of this. So, so a lot of different issues. Uh, I, I'm, I'm sorry I couldn't put it into one axis, but in fact it is multiple realities that need to be addressed. I just want to make a quick comment about how you talked about how a lot of the uh, organized um, uh, communist organizations have this idea sort of that, uh, well, the American people by and large can't be convinced of socialism or communism. I have an interesting uh, story about that. Um, speaking with uh, one of my uh, co-workers who's a Trump supporter actually, who I talk uh, about politics quite a bit, um, it was very interesting. Uh, this is someone who has uh, expressed um, quite a bit of anti-China sentiment as well. Um, and to give so now this is a very extreme example, but it, I think it says a lot to how false this idea is that, oh, Americans can't be convinced of socialism or communism. The, uh, the situation in Korea came up, and I was able to, through talking about, quite briefly about the history of the situation in Korea, how uh, the northern government was created by the Korean patriots who fought against the Japanese occupation, while the South Korean government was by and large formed uh, by the traitors, the collaborators, many of them who changed their names to Japanese names, and getting into the facts and stuff, I was able to convince this Trump supporter who was very anti-China that the North Koreans and the Chinese were the good guys in the Korean War, <laughs> and he agreed. <laughs> and I think that's, that's quite an extreme example, but um, uh, I mean, the truth, uh, the American people, when you, when you lay out the facts to them, especially much more direct issues, um, Absolutely, you know, the American people definitely can be convinced of socialism, I'm sure. Um, it's a little complicated, but um, I'm a, a child of the 60s, so um, you spoke about, um, you know, the machine and how it no longer has appendages. That, that, that was pretty interesting. I don't know if it really corresponds to, and, and this is what I'm trying to. Uh, flesh out a little bit. Um, so in the 60s, the, the, the plan for the youth was basically to drop out, to actually separate themselves from the establishment, the machine itself, right? So you had a central machine, an organization, a, a tradition, a way of thinking, and the youth was trying to become more autonomous or maybe creative or um, becoming uh, their own, you know? Uh, and then they would try to form groups and try to see if they had something in common with other people and try to come up with some new ideas on how to organize things. But now what I see in the youth, and it's sort of late, I mean, keep in mind I was born even before the calculator was invented, so there was no computer, no machine. Now the machine that we're talking about now is, is this thing that everybody has in his pocket and it has all the features of everything, of entertainment, of you can't even find a place to go you know, uh, without even thinking, right? So you don't even know where you are. I mean, if you ask somebody now, how do they drive to one from one point to another? They don't even know if they go south, north, etc. So now you you are saying that the machine itself or the central machine doesn't. You know, it's a bit like Alpha Villa. Everybody will become lost because they don't even know what to do without being programmed. Because that's what's happening to the youth. They from a very young age of six years old, they have this little machine. They don't even talk, they don't relate to people unless you force them to. And I want you maybe, if you have some ideas on how to address this, because I think that if to have a revolution, people have to group together, they have to work together, but, but that mode of working 
through uh, of, you know so social groups or something like that you know like electronically I have a lot of um, fear that this is not really what we're talking about so maybe you can expand a little bit on that okay if, cool. if you have any ideas. sure yeah anyone else um, well yeah um, that model quote that you um, said about um, the part where you mentioned like a new mankind that would be um, better than the old mankind. That made me think of um, the fact that something that doesn't get talked about enough, but like it's like um, like an underlying issue that like may come up in the future that's going to be very important is that um, genetic engineering is getting more and more advanced by the years, and um, depending on like how our economic system is framed and stuff like that. It could be like a great thing like with um, the self-driving cars or it could be end up being like um, a dystopian nightmare and granted you know that my thoughts on this is um, affected because I, I read a lot of fiction so you know I think about this more than probably the average person would but I do think like it's a serious issue but I'm optimistic and that's part of part of the reason why I support like socialist ideas and tendencies because I, I want this to be a positive thing and not like a negative thing. Anyone else? Yeah, I just want to ask, like, how, how do we kind of break the hold of imperialism on people's minds? A lot of people brought, brought it up, you know, and I, I, it seems to me now, like, stronger than ever. So you're right that there are polls showing people are open-minded to socialism, but it still seems like, um, you know, perfect example is just, like, I think just yesterday, like, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez sent out a tweet, you know, attacking Trump because uh, he sided with Kim Jong-un. Like, it, it, you know, it's so, th this mentality that we have the right to rule the world is so deep, even the most radical, and I admire, actually, I admire Kazi Kord in many ways, I'm not, you know, but like, even someone like that, is, is, it gets, gets drawn into it. Yeah. Okay, so, um, I, oh, did, I was wondering about you mentioned this a little about it over an hour ago, but I mean, uh, I didn't know anything about that. That was a big new Brzezinski was was and the national security state, American national security state was was funding Pol Pot and the Khmer Rouge and secretly funneling weapons to them. Uh, is there any any way to uh, where would I learn about a little bit more about that? Maybe if if uh, you can remember where you learned about it, uh, I'm curious about that. I didn't know anything about that. I just wanted to add uh, one more thing. Uh, I was actually talking about this with someone earlier, um, and this really gets into um, how material reality and the international situation uh, so affects, um, I mean, that, that's uh, the idea of scientific socialism and that ideas come from, uh, the key question is material reality, not ideas, and uh, we were talking about Gaddafi earlier. And it's very interesting because if you look at what Gaddafi was saying when he started compared to what he was saying by the 80s, it was very different. For example, you look at some of the, um, what the Libyan government was promoting in the early days, it was definitely socialist, but it was interesting because it was, it would claim to be both against communism and against capitalism. But by the 1980s, that had changed quite dramatically because of the uh, extreme attacks by U.S. imperialism, and um, go, coming starting out as someone who was opposed to both the Soviet Union and the U.S., similar to like the Khomeini style, neither east nor west. By the 19, uh, 1987, Gaddafi said that, quote, Libya will in fact declare that it is a communist country and join the Warsaw Pact and deploy Soviet missiles on the coast of the Mediterranean. <laughs> <We're> just, <laughs> just, and that's uh, according to multiple news sources. It's it, a rotten bourgeois nationalism. Yeah, you know. <laughs> yeah. Oh, Jim. Yeah. No, no, just that, I mean, it really says a lot. And it's funny because a lot of those, I wonder what the, a lot of those communists, American communists, would have said if they saw a quote like this because according to them he hadn't said the magic words but <laughs> sounds like he said the magic words. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um so you'll address these points and we'll say Yeah, I will address these points and then we'll conclude. Does that sound good? Or does anyone else have anything they want to add? Because we still got got time. Alright, cool. Alright, so
I'm going to try to address everything here. Um, first of all, you know, it's interesting. You mentioned National Socialism in Germany and Bonapartism and what's going on in the United States. The best book I've ever read on Nazi Germany, and there's so much on Nazi Germany. You go to Strand Bookstore, right? And they've got every book on Hitler, Hitler's dog, the biography, Hitler's foot, Hitler's shoes, Hitler's, you know. But the only book that I've ever read that really gave me an insight into what the Nazi regime did was called Hitler's Banker by Hallamer, uh, it was about Hallamer Schacht, who was the Nazi banker. It was the economist of Nazi Germany. And he lays out what Hitler did, which was the, you know, the Nazi party seized power, and then they created some very dramatic economic shocks. Um, they started building the autobahns, they built a network of concentration camps and put the entire labor movement in them so there were no strikes and protests. And they also started, uh, they broke the Versailles Treaty, they stopped paying back loans to the United States and Britain, and then they, on top of that, started military spending again. And actually, the U.S. economy is probably very close to the economic model that, that the Nazis developed, which is that it's it's military Keynesianism. The government in the United States spends lots of money. It just doesn't spend giving us health care and jobs and stuff. It spends it on the military, right? And the U.S. economy is so tied in, and that was during the Cold War, the point that leftists and socialists constantly made was the military-industrial complex is the basis of the U.S. economy. We're selling weapons all over the world. We're constantly at war because our economy is, is military Keynesianism. And the Nazi state was very much a military Keynesian state. So you could almost argue that the economic model we have in the United States is somewhat based on what the Nazis were able to pioneer. But the other thing that was pointed out is that, you know, that so Hitler came to power, violently took power, suppressed all the communists, put people in concentration camps, hired all these people to build. And so for the first three or four years of Nazi Germany, you had this extreme big economic boom. But the reason World War II happened, and the reason that Kristallnacht happened, is by the end of the 19, uh, 1930s, their economy was on the brink of, of falling apart, because that only works for so long. And it was still a capitalist economy. Um, the, the, most of the companies were still private. It was just the government was making sure the workers did what they wanted and they were kind of coordinating with the government. But it was still a capitalist economy. And it still had all the problems. They had just carried out dramatic Bonapartist shocks. And, you know, same for, you know, Louis Bonaparte. He took power 1851. By 1871, they had the Paris Commune. And they, I mean, the, the, the Bonapartism is only a temporary fix. Um, and, and it doesn't work for very long, um, and it doesn't resolve the problem of capitalism. It doesn't change the means of production to functioning in a rational way. Um, I think that Bonapartist struggles could lead to socialism, but if Bonapartism doesn't, you know, it, do, it, it doesn't lead to socialism, like in right-wing fascistic Bonapartism or, 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 or you know, Louis, Louis Bonaparte, in that case it definitely didn't because they were suppressing the con it, it tends to just reintroduce the same problem. It's a temporary fix. Uh, but it doesn't address the issue. Um, what you raised about people, uh, you know, like the, the Lakota people, and, and, you know, I always make the point that the United States is a country, but it's not a nation. That a nation is a group of people with a common background, a common language, uh, a common culture, a common economy, uh, and that the United States is not a nation by any means. There are nations within the United States. There's the Lakota, there's the Chicano people of the Southwest. I would say the descendants of African slaves constitute a nation within the United States. And there are nations within the United States. I don't think that there is a white nation in the United States. These people calling themselves white nationalists are completely crazy because like, they, you know, white people in the United States have nothing in common other than not being black or brown, so they're not a nation by any means. But there is a black nation, I think. There is a Chicano nation. There's indigenous nations, First Nations peoples. Um, and that I would think that any kind of socialist government that would come into being would, would try to grant those who want the right to self-determination uh, that right. And I know Kiki is going to give a class on communists and the black national question. Um, and that the demand in the 1930s was for the black belt. Um, and the idea that the, the parts of the South that at that point were still majority black would become an independent black republic in the South. And the Communist International pushed forward and then the Nation of Islam adopted that position as well. And a lot of black nationalists joined with the Communist Party in the call for an independent black socialist republic in the US South. Now, for a group of white people in the United States to go around advocating that sounds almost like segregation or something. So it, it wouldn't be you know, something to, to advocate. But at the same time, if people of color wanted to have an independent black republic, that would be something that would be discussed. And granting autonomy to colonized people within US borders, I would think would be something that any legitimate serious socialist movement would advocate. Um, now, you raised the whole thing about, first of all, you, you talked about in the 1960s, the goal was to drop out. And then you talk, You went on to talk about 
the issue of um, you know people all being on the machine, the machine is so big. and programming. And yeah. Well, on the first point, I, I, I really this leads me to what I, I really want to say, and it addresses kind of what you raised about AOC, which is well, which is the fact that that we have to talk about this, and it sounds it, it's people don't like it when you talk about it. The synthetic left, we have to talk about, it. and and it ties in with Pol Pot, right? Pol Pot was funded by the United States. Weapons were airdropped into into Cambodia to give him support. He was supported by the United States in exterminating the actually communist wing of his own party. But what was the definitive position of Pol Pot? What separated Pol Pot from the Marxist-Leninists in, in his party, from the Vietnamese, even from the Mao in China? He didn't believe in industrialization. Pol Pot believed in agrarian socialism. Cambodia is this deeply poor agrarian country, and he says, that's fine. And he forcibly evacuates the cities and sends all the people in the cities to the countryside, and he says, we're going to have farm socialism. Right? Socialism without industrialization. Socialism without historical progress. His broadcasts say Cambodia is such an advanced country that we're going to we're going to skip industrialization. We're going to keep the the chronically low level of economic development. We're just going to make it fair. Right? It's going to be fair. It's going to be redistributing poverty. Right? That is not socialism. Right? Redistributing poverty is not socialism. But there are sections of, of the revolutionary intelligentsia who really do believe that, right? Um, and that you know the, the dropout stuff in the 1960s. I mean, there there was a, a big belief on the part of American intelligence agencies, a big fear that that in response to McCarthyism, there would be a blowback, and that young people in the United States would join the Communist Party, would join the Socialist Workers Party, and after McCarthyism, you know. You know, faded, or, or, or there was an upsurge of young people supporting John F. Kennedy, supporting the civil rights movement, and a lot of these young people were joining the Socialist Workers Party, were joining the Communist Party. There was a, a student nonviolent coordinating committee eventually formed something called the RAM, and, and they had a vision of forming a new Communist Party that would be more inspired by China. And operations were carried out by U.S. intelligence agencies to create a synthetic left. And I mean, and you can read about the Congress for Cultural Freedom program. It's public record now. It's on the CIA's website that they began funding left-wing sounding operations to pull young people away from, from the existing communist organizations. They funded Partisan Review magazine, which looked like a communist Trotskyist magazine, but it was all paid for by the CIA. Um, you know, Susan Sontag was brought to us. The writings of George Orwell, which are very good writings, but, but you know, they lead you to anti-communist conclusions. They were funded. And that there was an effort to try and create a left that was anti-communist. And, and unfortunately, the, the ideological influence of these ideas, it's not simply that they were anti-communist, but it's pessimism, right? It's this belief that, that, that communism is about redistributing poverty, anti-consumerism, right? And that the ideas that come from the CIA-funded left of, of the new left of the 1960s are very anti-historical progress. It's very similar to Pol Pot, right? Well, the problem is too much stuff. The problem is we need to be impoverished. Technology, we've gone too far. It's the Tower of Babel. Let's go back to the good old days. But, you know, that very much is the same idea. And I think these ideas are out there. And that's why these kind of events and meetings are so important. Because, you know, I mean, we need to counter pessimism. We need to counter non-materialist, idealistic, synthetic socialism. Um, and I think that that's, that's so important. And that's why it's important that we do these events. You asked about Brzezinski. Um, you know, Zbigniew Brzezinski, Polish American. Mm -hmm. His daughter is actually on uh, Morning Joe. Did you know that? If you watch Morning Joe, his daughter is Mika Brzezinski. And um, Zbigniew Brzezinski, he, he was effective in coordinating anti-communist uprisings in Poland. He was coordinated anti-communist uprisings in Czechoslovakia. But we all know what his crowning achievement was, was he gave the Soviet Union their Vietnam by working with Osama bin Laden in Saudi Arabia to fight against the People's Democratic Republic of Afghanistan. But, but what Brzezinski was able to do was he realized that in the socialist countries there were, there were some people that were very privileged. They were the children of the party elite and the party bureaucracy. And they lived in comfortable, you know, relative comfort compared to the rest of the population. And they were college educated. And a lot of them really, really felt stifled by the socialist system. And so Brzezinski worked to kind of facilitate a relationship with those people in order to get them to believe that they were fighting for some kind of democratic socialism. If you look all throughout Eastern Europe in the, in the late 1980s, the people that brought down the socialist governments of Eastern Europe, the people that brought down and brought Boris Yeltsin into power in Russia, 
A lot of them really did believe that they weren't fighting for capitalism. They thought, well, we're going to keep socialism, but we're going to be able to shop at Walmart, and we're going to be able to, uh, to have American computers and TV, and uh, on top of that, I'll be able to write whatever I want. It'll be this new democratic form of socialism. And there's a book that was published, and it's very eerie, and it was published, it's called The Aquarian Conspiracy. Um, and it was published by one of these, these intellectuals. And if you look at the names of people who endorse it, they're all CIA-linked intellectuals. And it opens out by saying this book is neither pro-communist or anti-communist. It's a new movement of just young people rejecting war and materialism and wanting to go back to nature. And you read it, and it sounds really like hippie 1960s. It's a, it's a covert operation. And that Brzezinski and Soros, those folks had more to do with toppling the Soviet Union than Reagan does. Fox News wants to give Reagan all the credit. Military spending, he did it. That's bombast, because anyone who looks into what actually happened with the fall of the Soviet Union knows that the liberals that created this kind of fifth column of very confused middle-class intellectuals in the socialist countries. That had a lot more to do with it. And the color revolutions, like what we're seeing now in Hong Kong, like what we saw in Libya, like what we saw in Syria, this is from that very same playbook. And the grievances, often the grievances that, that Brzezinski and others were, were effectively manipulating were very real, right? These countries were very authoritarian. People didn't have the same level of free speech. The, the economic level, because they're surrounded and blockaded, you know, I mean, we, we shouldn't try to gloss over the fact that these folks had real grievances. But they were manipulated by people who ultimately wanted to make it worse. And I think that's the important thing, thing to say um, about that. And that, that, yes, militarism is an essential part of the United States. And drone warfare, uh, I mean, at this point, they don't need soldiers, right? Um, but then that, that raises the question, would the United States ever be able to have, quote unquote, total war? We haven't had total war in this country since the Second World War. And at this point, with so much alienation, would we be able to have total war? And then that raises points to what, what you said about, yes, it's scary. People are programmed on their phones, right? I mean, they talk about this phenomenon. In Japan, they have a name for it. But it's all over the world now of young, it's mainly young men who don't leave their houses, who stay inside all day long. That's social death. I mean, and, and you look at the suicide rate. It's scary, but then you put that in the context of what, what, what Hillary Clinton and other people have said about there's just too many people in the world and all of that. I, it's disturbing to me that, you know, this, this, this show that was on Netflix, 13 Reasons Why, basically an advertisement for suicide. And, and people watch that show, teenagers that are depressed watch that show and kill themselves. And it's still on there. And there's no, it's just, oh, well, it's, I mean, it, it, it's, it's documented to be increasing the suicide rate, and, and there's no one stopping them. Right? This new Joker movie that's about to come out, people say this is like an advertising for mass shootings. I mean, this guy's an incel. It's basically about the Joker and Batman's an incel and the world doesn't understand him, so he becomes a mass murderer. It's like an advertisement for mass shootings. I mean, the belief among the richest and most powerful capitalists seems to be, hmm, we're having problems on the global economy, climate change. Well, there's just too many people in the world and we need to just start gradually eliminating them. So you say this is an ideology? It's not really the capitalist system that's creating these conditions? It is the capitalist system, but it's a conscious effort by, I would say, the most powerful capitalists. Whereas I feel like the lower level of capitalists they really do want to expand, and they want to, they want to grow more, and they, they kind of reject the pessimism. So it's a very weird moment that we're in, where there's a divide among the bourgeoisie, and the richest of the rich seem to be pushing this historical pessimism, while the lower levels seem to be confused and trying to hold on to libertarian free market principles and trying to, under the illusion that almost industrial capitalism can return. And it's very scary, but ultimately what it points toward is the machine that you're talking about. When you, instead of talking about one little machine, like a phone, you're talking about the big machine, cyberspace, needs to be controlled by the people. And, and they know it's only a matter of time before that happens, right? That, that, you know, Mark Zuckerberg, they drag him before Congress and humiliate him. Why did you allow people to say this? Why do you allow people to say that? And they're humiliating him. They want him to censor people on Facebook way more than he's doing. But you know why he's not doing that? Because he wants everyone on Facebook. He would rather people say it on Facebook than say it somewhere else. And it's only a matter of time before some kind of social media outlet from some place, perhaps from you know a country that's an anti-imperialist country, perhaps just an alternative within, you know, it's pretty soon the tech monopolies are going to lose their monopoly, and when that happens, their ability to control things is going to be drastically reduced. Right? Silicon Valley was the very much it was created because there was forward thinking among the intel agencies. In the 80s, they realized the Soviet Union didn't have enough money to invest in computers the same way we did. And the NSA and the CIA you know, started loaning money to computer companies and trying to just foment a computer revolution, even though the market wasn't really rewarding it. 
That's why Al Gore very, you know, he said, I invented the internet. Well, he was saying, we made the conscious decision to have the government fund the computer revolution for strategic reasons. We know the first internet was DARPA, which was the, you know, yeah, and, but they're at the point where this technology is out there. If they turn, they have the kill switch now. Have you heard of this? It's a, if there's a national security emergency, they can turn the internet off. Eh, let them do it, right? There'll be one coming out of somebody's basement the next week. It, it, no, I'm serious. You can't, it's like the printing press. You can't hold, you can't, you know, put the baby back in after it's been born, right? I mean, history keeps marching forward. And they've lost control of their machine to some degree or other. Countries around the world that are not part of this capitalist system are emerging. BRICS and the One Belt, One Road initiative is, is happening, and there's a whole alternative, and the West is starting to come apart, and, and we're living in a period of transition. And I think that the next few years could be very, very exciting. And I hope that these classes that we're doing are gonna play a role in that. I can't wait to hear what Wenhong has to say next week. It's gonna be great. Let's, let's all come back and be here next week. So, thanks. <laughs>